Hello, everybody. Welcome, 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 gatekeepers. I'm reading your comments, and Renice said, I wonder if there are real vampires. You know, Renice, I've been studying this for weeks. I've been hearing about it all my life, just like you guys. But I've been really studying it hard for like four weeks now, maybe a little longer. Digging deep, getting into the research, following Ron's lead, taking going down other authors, other screenwriters, you know, throughout history and not just in America. We tend to, in America, stay in America and don't think about, you know, well, it's happening here, 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 here. But it was Asia and Africa and every culture, every century, I almost want to say, there was something, whether even if it was just medical mishap, you know, um, misunderstanding, uh, jumping to conclusions, uh, old wives tales, um, a little bit of what was that and how could they, and how did that just happen? And what, I mean, mix all that together. You've got the best vampire stew I've ever come up with. And to go back in and separate that after it's been baking all these centuries, it's near impossible. And again, just like a lot of the things that are paranormal, I have more questions now than I did when I started. You know, it's like we, if you don't really think about it, you just accept it as it comes in throughout your life. You know, a little Dracula here, a little Gary Oldman over here, a little interview with a vampire. And oh, what's that over here? Something else that's probably a vampire or at least wants to, you know suck your soul out of you or something i mean life force or whatever so the answer to your question renice is um i don't know <laughs> i don't know we get steve stockton in here and see what he thinks steve you just pop in when you're ready honey um and uh we'll get this showboat on the road but um it's been very interesting i have a couple things to talk about uh real quick um, Ron, it's wonderful. I'm so excited that Ron is going to come on, uh, once a month. We're going to go through the books. Um, I'm so excited that, you know, Steve and I have been doing this for, I don't know how I lost count a long time ago. Um, and it's, he's got so many wonderful books and so creative and his channels and the people that, um, you know, are in it, you know, in and around him, um, just coming out with great stuff. Um, all of these composers, uh, the music tonight is mostly Kevin Mc, uh, Mc, McLeod, I believe. And, um, I think that last one you just heard was, and, uh, all the GIF artists or, or people that design, uh, graphic design, uh, logos, uh, podcasters, authors, artists, sculptors, we celebrate them all. And, um, I can't thank you enough for being here. Um, I also want to ask the mods, please, please, please do not hesitate. My trusted gatekeepers. If you have a wrench, I trusted you to watch where I can't watch. So it's kind of like, you know, an extra set of eyes. You got my six. If there's ever anybody upset in the chat, you guys do a great job. I always see every, you know, people in there. Okay. This one's got it. And that's how much. That's like the best compliment I could possibly give is to look and go, and Edna's on it. Lindsay's got it. You know, uh, Sapphire uh, is, try is, is helping out. You know, you could see glimpses. Jack's in there or Glenn's in there. If anything ever happens in the chat where somebody's upset enough that they possibly are saying things that could upset the guest, especially if a lot of guests don't pay attention to the chat or cannot see it. It, it, you know, we don't want to assume anything because I've asked a lot of guests, can you see the YouTube chat? No. Can you see, are you seeing the stream yard chat? No. Um, some are watching it on their phone. Some are, you know, you just don't assume what people can and can't see or whatever. And some people will be obvious because they're going to say, Hey, so-and-so in the chat, I've had guests on here like Rob and Ron and, you know, a couple other ones that, see more of what's going on in the chat than I did because I'm trying to remember what the heck I'm saying. 
um, where that question went and trying to grab all these thoughts and keep them in a bag and let them out one crazy, batshit crazy idea at a time. So I don't always see. So don't assume I saw or, you know, again, you guys are in there. You're in there on, along this journey. It could be a dark and twisted hallway. I got to talk to the the one I'm, I'm walking with so we can kind of sort it and then reach out and see what you ha guys have to say. I can't catch everything. So if somebody's upset, all I ask is that, listen, not every show is going to be for everybody. I, I get that. And I respect that. Dude, pop out. I'll see you tomorrow. Come back, whatever. But here's the thing. Mods, if you can't, if if for any reason somebody's upset and 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 you think that the guests might see it and be upset or feel unwelcome or feel, you know, again, I come old school. Somebody comes over for dinner. You don't think my aunt or somebody, my, my nana would kick me under the table if I smarted off to a guest? You know, it's, it's, I know that sounds weird and old school and maybe it's not the same way everybody thinks, but think about it this way. And again, I'm not upset or anything because I don't even know what happened. But if you know, you know, and I don't want to know. I just want to say, I want everybody to be happy. We come here to be happy. But if there's somebody, if we're talking about something that it's not your cup of tea, catch your next show. I mean, is that fair? Love you. I'm sorry it wasn't for you. I'm going to, you know, miss you have it in the chat tonight. But please, you know, I want you comfortable as well. And that's a hard thing to do. That is a hard thing to balance between guest, knowledge, research, facts, fiction, lies, truth, um, real, real solid facts with proof, uh, archaeology or something else. Again, that can also be misunderstood and misinterpreted, just like many, many things. You have to sort these things yourself, guys, and your filters. You know, I'm not here to tell you what to think. Hell, I don't even know. Hello, sweetheart. Hey, Cathedra, how you doing? And thank you for sharing. Everybody that shared, everybody that hit the like, thank you. So here's the thing. I don't want anybody to be upset. But may, my main thing is responsibility to people listening and to trying to find the facts and give you guys the facts. You guys got to sort it. That's your own thing. It's like, who's that guy? Is it Nuke? Top five? You decide. You be the judge. Who am I? Right. But again, you know, that's my main thing. My best compliment I can give. And I look over and I say, so, so, so and so's on it. Got this. That's like saying, you know, we're having a, a birthday party for a bunch of three year olds. Not saying you're all three year olds. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying as a mom, <laughs> that's the kind of chaos I'm talking about. It's like you're having a birthday party. You got adults that are just had enough and they're all like they're doing whatever they're doing. And the kids are, and you're trying to wrangle, you know, like herding cats and there's cake and then there's sugar. So let's put some more sugar on that, you know. And you, you want everybody to have a good time, but you don't want anybody to get hurt. My main thing is, 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 is when we have a show, we have an episode, the live chat, you and I are a team and I have a guest and, you know, we're going to show them the courtesy, right? Let's not yell at him if that's what happened. I don't even know. And I'm not saying that. I don't want to. It's what it is. But you have my permission to squash that if you think that the guest is going to be upset. Just I need you to be the grannies and grandpas at the table, the big table with the good linens on. You feel what I'm saying? There's entomans coming. There's dessert that you weren't allowed to touch for days and it's coming and the guest is feeling uncomfortable because, you know, nip that shit in the bud. Enough said. I love you all. You know, but it's not, I can't, I can't go back and take some history is gruesome. And if it's been researched and researched and researched by people that I trust everything, almost everything else they say, I trust what they're saying. I, they, You know what I mean? Who am I to censor that for you? Who am I to say, no, 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 we're not going to talk about that or we're not going to bring that part up because that might be a piece of the puzzle sometime. 
that you need. It's just, just that's my job. I'm just a bridge, like a medium. Here's a quick story. I'm still waiting for Steve to pop in. So, Steve, if you're there, just give me a sign, sweetie. If you need time, take it. So, that being said, you know, put that to bed. Just you guys handle whatever you need to, to handle, okay? Um, trying to remember if I said everything I wanted to say there. Yeah, that's, you know, a huge compliment. I look over there and go, you guys got it. And I don't see it. So I feel bad if somebody was upset about something or something happened in the chat. People are fighting. It's happened before. But then they're hurt or whatever. And I don't know. Everybody assumes I know. And I don't, I don't know. I'm researching. I'm trying to bring facts and putting them, you know, on at, in the middle of the table on one of those lazy Susan and just spinning it. Everybody, you know, grab what you need to grab. Put it in your bag. But again, you know, it's not meant to hurt anybody's feelings. Not everything's going to be for everybody. A lot of people couldn't, didn't want to sit through Velisca. Well, why are you, why are you letting him tell these gruesome details of this horrible murder? Because it happened. And for some reason, if, it, it, you know, if, if you need that information in the future or it helps you sort something out down the line or you're doing a podcast or writing a book or telling a story or or trying to add it into sorting something else in your life. And, you know, there's a parallel. God, let's not hope, you know, hope not. I took out a fact. I didn't let you have it. I didn't treat you like an adult. I'm going to say it's on the table. If you're full, get up. Come back for dessert. You feel me? Okay. So uh, Jacques St. Germain. Last night's vampires, vampires, vampires. Energy vampires. Uh, um, just everything from the gauntlet, cannibalism for the love of Pete. But again, why is that connected? Well, if you look around now, what are they trying to make normal? So how many shows on Netflix? How many movies? How many um, reality shows here recently just brought it up? Um, all the, Just all the things. You got to be aware. How long has this been going on? Forever. <laughs> you know what I mean? Is that, is it a thing? Does that have to do with vampirism? If you ask me, I don't know. I think it does if I'm looking at it like they made it normal. So, but that's still not the immortal vampire that you would consider to be Dracula or something along those lines. You with me so far? Excuse me. So, but all things considered, if you bring up the whole fact about the caves, there's Mr. Stockton. Get in here, you old rouse snake. You're muted, sweetheart. Oh, there we go. How's there that? he is. Hello, honey. You sound, you sound okay. Now, how's everybody doing? Good to see everybody. Isn't that great? Good to see. Good to see. Hello to Midnight Society. And Yeah, she's and, uh, holding down the couch over here, and she's uh, in the chat there. Hey Nick, love you, love you. Happy, happy one month anniversary, by the way. That's right. Yesterday, uh, the thirteenth was our one month anniversary. Why isn't there so, a song, Steve? We're still some, but there should be. Like happy birthday, we could sing, you know, a couple lines. Yeah, I we'll, think that we'll one, to, that one cost we'll talk you. Talk to Lee about. G about that and see if he'll write us a, a, a song. An for anniversary every, song. Every, Is there every, anniversary? Yeah. I guess there's got to be anniversary songs, but there's none that are synonymous with the day. You know, they'll have be songs on, you know, I'm sure there is. Isn't there happy anniversary, baby? There's that one. That's not, there's that yep. one. Yep. Oh, there, there we go. Which one? Which one? How you doing, Steve? God, it's been a week. Here's some, here comes bacon. You better catch it. Hey, JRG. Hey, Salvador, you sweetheart. Uncommon belief. My Salvador friend. Soto, how are you doing? Good to see you, brother. Aren't the kittens cute? My, my it's their birthday just, month. It's their birthday uh, month. Everything is growing like crazy here. And they are a year life. old yeah. tomorrow. It's Bucephus and Spirit are a year uh, old tomorrow. Are you, are you having a birthday party for the Well, you know? I convinced I was. I thought, well, what if I invited the mayor? <laughs> what if I did it on social media? 
But if you invite enough people, say my cats are having a birthday, we're ha there's, there'll be cake, you know, and just was real serious, a straight face, stone faced about it. And just, you know, yeah, you know, you don't have to bring a gift, just bring you come as you are, you know, we're just celebrating, <laughs> play it real straight faced, you know, eventually somebody show up, somebody show up, maybe have some cat toys, some, some fur mice or something. <laughs> You know, wouldn't that be adorable? But I thought I would make people crazy and invite like celebrities and stuff, like on Twitter, or Twitter, That'd be or whatever funny. Call, you know. Do that like, and let's see like, how it turns out. You gave me an idea. Why not? I and mean, people invite people to the prom and people show up with them. I mean, you know, it's an awkward as all get out when it, everybody thinks it's going to be great, but it never turns out good because there's so much. Now you got the spotlights on you and people taking pictures and you got local news crew sticking her mic. How does it feel to be invited to a teenage prom? You know, well, I just came here to support her. I got her letter and I thought, it would, you know, you know what I'm saying? It never turns out right. <laughs> it's awkward, <laughs> but I think it would be worth, worth doing just to see the people around me go look crazy because somebody's oh, going to show up. Somebody's going to show up. Brad Pitt's going to pull up with a limo come out here with two cat toys and a, and, and a can of friskies <laughs> somebody's going to show up needs publicity you know what i mean I, I had a friend that did that when he graduated high school he sent uh little cards the invitations to like the mayor and uh, Why not? all these people and he got a bunch of gifts from people that had no idea who he was just you know somebody sent an office not? like this is somebody i know gave it to their secretary here buy this kid a gift he Steven, got some really good stuff. Steven, with all the crazy shit in the world, now I'd never want to take anything from anybody under false pretenses. I think that's just another. Well, he was graduating high another, school, so there you go. But yeah, but I'm it just saying. It was an auspicious fault. occasion if you had known the guy. Yeah. I mean, as a disclaimer, I would never condone anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I would never, I would never condone anybody going in and trying to hoodwink somebody for a dollar. You know what I mean? I don't respect not that. Not for a dollar, maybe but, five you know, or ten, but not for a dollar. A good sarcastic, you know, <laughs> something or other. Like, look, it's Cat's birthday. Let's do some. Let's have some fun in the neighborhood. Block party. Let's shut down the street and, and, and celebrate you know, life and your pets. You know how and, people feel about animals. Love, you know, I, you know, yeah. I say that at the end of my videos. Tell your animals i said hi tell your pets i said hi i get so much reaction out of that yeah start out tell your dogs i said hi all the cat people got offended got their panties so then i started walk. saying tell your dogs and cats i said hello yep, then yep, i had yep. the people with uh bearded dragons and a desert tortoise and chickens oh, wonderful and all this stuff. So i just started Rabbits, saying, tell your tell your animals hamsters, i said hello chinchillas snakes yep. when i was at pet smart Anything could come walking through that door. I'll tell you what, Steve. Did I ever tell you that story? <gasps> Steve, what do you think this was? I swear to God, this just popped up in my head, and I've never told this story, ever. I think I told my son once, but it's never left me. This is wild. I swear it happened. There, this is not hyperbole. I am not exaggerating. I am not adding for effect or anything else. I swear to you it happened just like this. I'm working at the pet. It was a pet smart or pet? Co it was pet smart i worked at both pet smart pet coast i had to remember where i was according to the register in the front door so i was actually uh i know why i'm having a hard time i was a visiting manager i went training in inside the district but it wasn't my store that's why it's funny so anyway i'm standing there and i'm running the register and everybody else in the back either restocking or zoning or you know doing closing duties and i'm filling in at the register so this person could have a break right last of the night all of a sudden and it's dark it's dark it's got to be like nine o'clock in alabama you know somewhere in alabama and there's nothing in the music nothing good act. happens after nine o'clock in alabama i'm telling you he said it folks not me so anyhow <laughs> it's i know it's dark because you're constantly looking at the door and as soon as that outside door opens you know you're looking up because there's a vestibule which is the weirdest word ever just saying vestibule so that you hear the outside the church. door slide and then the next door comes open you know what i mean so there's your person right so i just stop doing what i'm doing and i look up and i swear it happened just like this it's dark you can't see anything hardly out the just a little dim light from the from the parking lot right 
and a, a light fog. I shit you not. <laughs> just just coming over the 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 parking lot and, and the and the doors, you know. But of course, it's outside because there's a vestibule. The next door swings open in a little bit of a wind. If there had been leaves, they would have blown in at this time, but there was no leaves. And this man, he's filling up most of the doorway because he's a big old cowboy. I'm not making this up. He's wearing everything he's wearing is in the dark. It's not black. It's in the really dark brown family. So it's like weathered leather. He's got that Stetson hat. You know, I don't know if it was Stetson, but it was it was the cowboy hat. He's got the leather. I can't make this up. He's got the leather trench coat. He's got cowboy boots, of course, and jeans. Big old belt, and there's something on the belt that made me think automatically this is a cop, an undercover detective, uh, security of some sort, but nothing written. Just the way... The trench coat kind of blew with the wind when the door opened. You could just get a glimpse, just a little, a little, a little, a little, just a little bit, you know. And the bottom, I promise you, I think this guy had his own entrance music because it, it was like the music, <laughs> everything got quiet. And he didn't was it like just, the good and the bad and the ugly, something like that. It, no, it was, it was just like, it was, I swear to you, I thought. It went so fast, it was hard to process, but I was like frozen. It was almost like I was seeing a ghost, that kind of feeling. But it was a person, but there was more to him. So either he was highly, highly intuitive, you see, or it, it, he just put off an energy, kind of like Dracula, you know, kind of like Gary Oldman in Dracula. I'm not kidding. The pheromones that came in off of this guy. I mean, no joke. And I thought he was a vampire when he walked by. But he walks all the way up the aisle. And he comes back real and you can hear the boots. And I'm, I swear, I'm just still standing here, palms down on the counter. And he goes and he grabs a case of dog food, puts it on his shoulder, walks up. And I don't even remember him. The words, nothing. It was very few words credit card back on the shoulder and out the door on the same wind that he rode in on. But that guy was something. He was a vampire, a gin. Uh, you know what I mean? There was something, you know, those people that come by and you just know, but I didn't get anything bad off of him. Just that kind of, he knew I knew he didn't, he didn't smile like that, but he did tip his hat. That shit happened. That happened in places. I remember one time I was in Gatlinburg and I was down on the main drag there, the parkway. And there was this guy, he looked like a prophet out of the Bible, like one of those guys that had been out wandering the desert. He had on like looked like robes or something like that. He was carrying a staff that looked like a paddle, like you stir apple butter with, but it had symbols up in and in, cut into it. And he was looking above the town up in the mountains and i thought what what is that who's that what kind of person is that and i swear to god he turned around 180 degrees and looked me in the eye and smiled he heard and then you. turned back around i got the chill <laughs> i'm like i'm out of here dude what That's are you doing the, have at it it's that you know he knows he knows you know and he knows you know you know that he knows it's yeah. that it's almost like the Grinners, except it's not that evil feeling. It's more of a fair to Midland. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Could go either way kind of thing. But nothing you know, that definitive of the evil you know, part, you know. I interviewed a girl on my channel. Um, I can't remember what she goes by now. But um, she was up on Mount Shasta. And she was one of those people that she was living in uh, somewhere in Texas and felt Shasta's call and just quit her job, bought a bunch of camping gear and went to Mount Shasta, lived on the mountain, I think it's for five months. And she was talking about, she was down in the town of Shasta in one of those uh, crystal shops. And she said there was a guy in there. He was tall. He was blonde haired. He was just strange. And she, she just thought to herself, she's like, I wonder if he's one of those Lemurians I've been hearing about. And same thing from across the room. He turned, 
looked her straight in the eye and smiled at her and then turned back. He's like, she heard me or he heard me. Yes. He heard me. Those moments. Said, I got out of there. Oh my gosh, Steve, those moments are so profound. This dude, I, I mean, I think of it often, but I very rarely told the story, but there was something about him. You know, you could feel it. And the wind that came in, it was almost like a scene out of, of Empire. Yeah, K-Love is what she goes by. Her. And so that, uh, that's a good interview. The uh, Somebody in here said, I think it, I can't remember who, sorry, that um, Dogman, well, you know, that's what I thought too, Werewolf. There was something about this guy. There was something. He was something, you know, but he was Shape so overpowering. Wizard something. People have an aura or a presence about him that's undeniable. Yeah. I mean, he was so powerful when he was standing in front of me. And they know that you just, know. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just, and he's the whole time he's smiling behind this hat, man. But it wasn't a bad smile. It was more like a don't look at him in the eye. Don't look him in the eye. Don't look I'm just, you know, I kind of knew don't, don't, you know. And I was just being real short with him and cool and smile. I'm sure That's I was smiling. Kind of hearing your head. Smiling ear to ear. I this swear man to God, is on a mission. Do yeah, not detain or question him. Just yeah. let him do his thing. And I remember very little of that. I remember flashes of his smile and him looking at me, he had the bluest eyes. But he could have been. He could have been anything. He could have been a a guard, a, a spirit guide, guardian angel, anybody coming. It could have been a thousand different things, but it was something. He was something. And yeah, that, that, that wind, the, the wind and the they're, mist, they're rare. They're the wind, rare. wind and mist. <laughs> and, and, you know, obvious hypnotic or what do you call it? The mesmer. Uh, what was that guy's name? It was mesmer, mesmer, wasn't it? Mesmer. And he was mesmerizing. He mesmerized people. Yeah, that old Vulcan mind melt shit, yeah. you know. Scott, I'm glad you enjoyed the book. Thank you there. I've, I've had some other hey. good comments on it. Uh, somebody on Facebook commented today, they will never look at a frog the same way again. I don't want no spoilers if you haven't got to that story yet. Spoiler. But those are some really good first-person encounters. I will be narrating those. Uh, my publisher is setting up a separate YouTube channel. Where I'm just going to narrate that series of books. They're loading a uh, book five tonight, so that'll be available starting tomorrow. Because it knows that you know, <coughs> and you it knows that you know that you know it knows. So it smiles at you, and that makes it bad. It's not that I'll tell you if that's happened in my life several times, and it's more frightening than I, you could ever describe in words. It, it really is for that moment in time. It's like you just kind of freeze. It's frozen. It's like I here. talked about my cousin that had the boa constrictor and it wouldn't eat frozen mice or dead mice. It wanted to, to attack them itself. And I watched him feed it one time. He put a little mouse in there. That mouse is just like looking around little whiskers, you know, nose twitching. Suddenly it sat up on its haunches and it just froze. It knew it sensed that snake and the snake come out and did it. The mouse didn't even try to get away. It was just, it was absolutely frozen. And that's it's how you feel in yeah. a situation oh, like geez. that. It's not fight or flight or anything. It's just like sheer for, terror for a minute. You know. Or something. It's not necessarily fear. terror. Frozen it's fear. It's just a lock terror. up. It's an absolute lock up. Being in know? the presence. Now, I didn't something. lock up. I didn't lock up. What I was doing when I was looking at him, it was just such an easy transaction. You know, there's not much physical you know, effort there. You know, it's a case of dog food. It's a scan and a credit card and a receipt and out on the shoulder, out the door. So and that happened really fast, but there's just flashes of him looking at me and smiling, you know, out the, everything was from an angle. It was really wild. I can't explain that. Should put that in the story in a book. Unexplained, but you just so powerful. Never had that before with any. The only thing that was close was the the little boy in the cart, which was at AC Moore. And that was a grinner. That was a hundred percent grinner. You know that little kid. That was evil. I could feel that coming. Was that the one where the little kid it. was was kicking his mom or whatever? And I mean, I've seen some of those little devils like that too. It reminded me so much of the story. You know, I mean, say what you will about him. I'm not. You know, I'm not a fan, but I have to admit that when Bill Cosby came out with the um, the well, actually, I want to say stand up. It was more of a sit down. Everybody yeah. know if you saw it, you remember what I'm talking about. Yeah. And it was a comedy thing he did. And it was a special. 
and it was really big. And he told this story of the lady that got on a plane with Jeffrey and it was a little boy and he's like, sits down on the plane. Everybody knows the story. And, you know, the plane goes, I was looking around a young kid going to be a rough flight. And this kid terrorized the mom. And then when the mom got on the plane, she was a hundred percent all put together, had an Armani business suit on. She had her hair real tight in a bun. And when she got off the plane, that bun was swinging. <laughs> she was all tore up your shirt all out of her skirt and stuff. It was hysterical. That's what that story reminded me of because this little kid, two, three years old, dressed, looked like uh, the omen because he had a, like a, a kid's suit kind of thing, but yeah. shorts, almost like Angus wears, you know, with the little, yeah. the, the little, little leather shoes, school little socks. Suit, yeah, 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 yeah. The shorts and the, the jacket and the tie and the hat. Way too much outfit for a kid, you know. And mm -hmm. then here comes this mom looking like she works in like the best law firm in town all put together and tight and every, and she was buying a bunch of picture frames. Like she was redoing an office or a home and she's struggling because she's got them everywhere sticking out of the cart, you know, under the cart, down in the little thing. And, and the whole time, every time she bent down to get some, he'd kick her in the head. And I was just <laughs> like, <laughs> and she'd just stop it. You know, he obviously ruled that woman. And, you know, the, and she was just had so much, you could, her whole life was in her face. You know, it was like she was so stressed. So she was full tilt boogie career. You could tell about, you know, probably buying, like I said, for the business, you know. And here's this kid. <laughs> and that kid was so evil. I'm sorry to say that about a child, but what I'm talking about wasn't a kid, you know. No. I mean, so don't don't start writing me letters, folks. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that kid, it was straight up omen stuff because mm -hmm. he was a grinner and he knew I knew and when he looked at me and smiled that unnatural smile uh, and those eyes you know oof, they'll roll over black you know kind of like that scene in Jaws they'll roll over white after he bites you you know <laughs> and just dark dead eyes like a doll's eyes you know like that yeah that's creepy stuff dude but that one I felt coming that guy had nothing like that that it was just kind of Kind of like scenes out of uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula when Gary Oldman was in his little silk gray suit, his top hat, and his little blue glasses, his little bl blue uh, uh, John Lennon glasses, Yoko Ono. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and he walked down the street and ladies just pass out and stuff. Kind of like that. Yoko's still kicking, last I heard. But we, we're trying. We got her out of the Dude. Dakota, but that's as far as we can get her so far. Dude, so much stuff. I mean, I started doing... The vampires, because we had Ron, and I got to get you and Ron together on cryptids, and I'll just sit here and just learn, because that's that's one of my, uh, you know, I know some, but I don't know a lot, you know. Um, he, he brought up some interesting points last night. I was on uh, Ground Zero with Clyde Lewis a few months ago, I think it was around last Halloween, and talking about vampires, and he brought up the whole how it's like a, a take on Christianity where you have to invite Christ in, you have to invite the vampire in, uh, in the, the, the communion yeah. or Holy communion, you take of the flesh and of the blood, the vampire. There's is So it's, many wild parallels. Like a, and you wonder, did it build off of that, Steve? Like so much folklore that you're into, you've been doing all your life listening, first started listening to it and then started, you know, keeping chronicle of it and then retelling it, you know, so pretty much all your life. And we often wonder these seeds of facts that grow vines, you know, the humans put their little tastes on. Like there's a story now and I'll go ahead and tell it since we're doing vampires and, and maybe you've heard it, but uh, we're doing a little New Orleans tonight. Uh, you know more about that than I do. I've been there once and it, mm -hmm. and it was a quick in and out. Yeah, it was quick, you know, and I had kids. So it wasn't like I went to Mardi Gras, you know what I mean? I went to see somebody and we, Take, took a tour around that was it but that was right before a massive hurricane it was right before the one before katrina the real bad one before katrina and uh we were evacuating charlie, and didn't even realize charlie i don't remember dude i don't remember charlie, i just I, don't remember. I just know keep look i kept looking out the car behind me you know at the kids and looking out at the window going look at that sky is kind of green dark and <laughs> nasty looking you know and I had no idea we were evacuating in a flow. I just thought traffic was always like that. Yeah. <laughs> I was in there like, you know, less than 24. I think it was less than 24 hours. It was no big deal. But 
you know, to go during that time and have no idea we were that close to a hurricane. They got destroyed. Not as bad as Katrina, but pretty bad, you know. And uh, that was kind of crazy. But the whole place, you know, whether it was the storm coming in or whether it was the atmosphere or whether it was just me, I can tell you that place was heavier than Gettysburg ever was. And that's saying something in a different kind of way. There's a lot of energy in New Orleans and most of it's dark. It's palpable. It's so palpable, Steve, you know. So, um, and I'm not, you know, saying everything is bad, but, you know, anytime you've got something like that, you've got people that want to turn a situation bad or take take advantage of the energy in a space, whether it's a haunted house or, or something else, you know, um, and then that escalates whatever else was already there. Now you're magnifying it with your stuff and intent. So, I mean, this is what just happens, you know, certain places are more than others. And that goes the other way too. some peace places feel more peaceful and uh, filled with love and, and healing than others. So the opposite also has to be true. You know, I mean, it's just Monica, the bias that's right. There are more voodoo practitioners in New Orleans than there are in Haiti. And that's no exaggeration. Exactly. And there's all these stories coming out of New Orleans. We're not doubting that, you know, there's uh, underground clubs. There's not even underground anymore. Um, you know, we had Catherine Lamslin on. Uh, she's a, a, a psychologist and that's, you know, putting it uh, lightly. She writes for Psychology Today. She's wrote numerous books. She's been on huge cases like Jack the Ripper and um, the, the, um, the shepherd case with the, you know, the, the, did he kill his wife or not? You know, all of these. Sam Shepard. Yes. Well, that, that was an interesting one. Well, and a lot, a lot of people don't one know one when that was all over said and done, he admitted that he carried, I think it was a 38 revolver in his underwear into the courtroom. And he said, if they'd found him guilty, he meant to end it right there in the courtroom. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, he's probably not the only one that's done that. But uh, anyway, she told me uh, here live on the show that, uh, and we had talked about it before too, but uh, she said that uh, she spent, uh, I want to say two months. It was two something. It wasn't two years. So it was either two weeks or two months uh, in the uh, underground uh, vampire world to study it, you know? And the way she looked at me when she said it, Steve, she had that look on her face like there's there's some stories there you know i mean just you have to know to to know what i mean when i looked at her face i was like yeah i can't do it here i'm not gonna ask her you know <laughs> because she just had that little glint in her eye when she said it so i knew it was probably not gonna be safe for youtube but anyhow <laughs> you know uh but she said yeah and so i mean some of them absolutely drink blood. Some of them are energy uh, consumers. Some are both. Some are sexual energy con consumers. Uh, just across the board. But again, is that a vampire? Or is that somebody living a vampire lifestyle on, on whatever level? They're not immortal, or are they? You know, have they, you know, extended their life by doing this? Some would say yes. Some would say if they stop doing it, that, you know, their energy goes down and they, they get pale and they, this and that and whatever. And I'll tell you what I saw yesterday, Steve, I saw the last voyage of the Demeter at the, the theater. Yeah. And this is the seventh chapter of Bram Stoker's Dracula. And I believe that chapter is called Captain's Log, you know, and in there, they kind of, uh, they kind of uh, mentioned this a, a few times where regular people, um, you know, could feel better with blood. And the way they did that, they started out, and spoiler alert if you hadn't seen it, but it's a very small part. Uh, somebody get, gets a transfusion, but this is a transfusion from, what, 16, 17, whatever, Romania. <laughs> I mean, they're on a ship in the, headed to London, you know, I can't remember exact time. 18 maybe 18 so they've got they're doing a transfusion with a rubber hose a big old needle i mean a big old like this thing looked like a crochet needle and they're sticking you know and they just transferred the blood with a a little squeezy kind of rubber uh ball 
you know, to, to like pump a, air. Like a bulb syringe yeah, type yeah, thing. Thank I you. Have. Yes, yes, yes. And just gave blood that way. And this made this person stronger. And they had to do it a couple of times. So early blood transfusion. So again, now that was direct into the bloodstream. But these people are claiming that they do it by drinking the blood. So as gross as that sounds, it's my job to bring you the facts, folks. <laughs> don't, don't shoot the messenger or unsubscribe. I'll how dare I omit facts that you might need in the future or are interested in hearing now, you know, because I think it's too gross to say. I don't do that. We're going to put it on the table. You decide. So <laughs> don't pick it up. You know, I'm going to pass up the, 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 uh, green bean casserole and the damn mashed, uh, whatever you call that thing with the, with the onions in it and all that. Oh, geez. This old pearl onions, mashed potatoes, pearl. I don't know. People have dishes at Thanksgiving tradition, you know. They don't take everything off the plate just because it's offered. Right, Steve? You catching my analogy? Get a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I'm just the cook in the kitchen. If you don't like, then you just don't get any of that. Nope. I'm not. I'm just the cook in the kitchen. But you damn well better keep your hands out of my pot. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, here's a quick story in New Orleans Vampires. Carter Brothers. Have you heard this one, Steve? Mm -hmm. So I think it was what, 30s, 34, 30, something, somewhere in there. Two Carter oh, Brothers. Okay. What happens is it involves a prostitute, um, or at least a, a young lady. Let's say that. Some called her prostitute, some didn't. Again, I didn't research this and read journals and go back to this historical society and read documents on this one. I'm just giving you the best facts I can out of multiple stories. So this girl escapes. Um, she's got blood on her. She's got slits on her wrists uh, with bandages and they're a mess. Okay. And she's screaming incoherently that she has just escaped these two vampires. Yep. They were the she car intercepted by a police officer and just out of her mind with, with fear and this wild story. They'd had her tied down with ropes and they'd been a little careless and she was able to, after they'd done a feeding, she was able to get away and take off. Absolutely. And they worked at the, I think, the shipyard, the brothers together. So she told them, look, I'll take you to the place. So they go back to the place. And when they get there, there's four more people tied to chairs in the same condition she was in. Right, Steve? And yeah, a horrible and they're, they're smell. Wrapped with bandages and stuff. And uh, uh, everything horrible was moist, smell. stained with blood. Yep. Right. So they further investigate this big apartment and it's up in one of those buildings like I showed you here in the in the uh, opening video here. Let me see if I can just pull up a picture here. That's the wrong one. What the hell is that? Is that it? Do, 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 do. Bear with me, folks. I'm trying to get you a picture. Just like that. You see this? In fact, let me run a lip because I think that might be the house. Right there. So down this, this is a French Quarter. And as you see these buildings, they've got a lot of balconies. If you've never been there, that's the big thing. It's all about this wrought iron and everything. It's absolutely yeah. gorgeous. I mean, and during Mardi Gras, those spaces on the balconies go for premium. Oh, at, oh, geez. You know, good luck even trying to get near one. So, yeah. so here's a good one here. So you can see the balcony. So what this girl did uh, was she... Did, this whole thing up here is a huge apartment. These things look a lot, they're a lot bigger than they look. Okay. So they go in and they start investigating this mess and they find a room in the back and it's got all a bunch of dead bodies covered up with sheets. 14, I believe I've heard 12 and I've heard 14. So they go to arrest these dudes. They're gone. You know, they, they're they trying to catch them. They never go back to the apartment, but they show up at work. They show up at, at, at work and uh, they try to detain them there. And they just disappeared, didn't they, Steve? I think so. They they admitted that they were vampires and that they if they were let go, they would have no option but to continue to kill. So what do you think? Like I that? think I've got it here. 1932. 32. I thought, man, I was, I was dead You're on close. the money. I was, I was yeah. close. I knew it was something close. Yeah. And that's something. Hey, Sarah, how you doing, sweetheart? So, uh, there you go, Monica. Yep. So and that's allegedly, that one. They, they did catch them. They were tried as serial killers 
convicted and then executed. Yeah, that's the rumor. I mean, that's as far, as far as I know, that's unsubstantiated, but that's the, the, the folklore. Yep. And I don't know if I had it here. I was going to check really quick. I pulled up something. One second here. Let me see. Yep. So uh, 32. Do, do, do. Yeah. And I mean, they would, the, you know, how awful is it to go in there and you're tied to a chair and your wrists are healing up and then they come back the next day and recut it up and, you know, start draining blood. And how horrific to go through something like this. And there's something similar in uh, the last voyage of the Demeter. And I'll tell you, um, they display it very well. It's, it's horrific to even think about. Um, yeah, it says, unaware that the girl had escaped, John and Wayne Carter went about the routine as usual. Only this time, the police waited for the brothers to return, and they were quickly apprehended and, upon their capture, confessed almost immediately, begging to be murdered. Take us out. Yeah, because they say, we're going to do it again. We have to. We have the sensational appetite. We're vampires. But, again, vampires? So that's what we're asking tonight about uh, St. Germain, Steve. Yeah, I, I wish know. they'd unwrapped that a little more and to, about the guy's testimony. How did they become vampires? Did somebody turn them? How did these two seemingly normal, right. some degree, brothers decide that they were vampires and that they had to feed in order to live and they had to, contil, had to kill in order to feed? Right, right. Something else. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, that's what we were talking about last night with Ron, uh, going over all the movies. And I mean, there's 300 movies uh, dedicated to vampires, Dracula, not just Dracula, but vampires and the like. And there's been the only one that's even close to coming in second on the amount is Sherlock Holmes. So, I mean, there's obvious interest in vampires and the lore and trying to understand it and we picked out a couple of the movies that really kind of laid it all out there in the right way i mean even like lost boys was just a breath of fresh air because here's young vampires um oh, yeah, my, nicole yeah. had never seen that we watched it a couple of nights ago that that movie is the 80s I mean, in, in a encapsulation right there and it was they called it, I think, Santa Clarita in the movie, but it's based on, I think, Santa Santa Cruz. Carla. Santa Carla, wasn't it? Or no? Something like that. Yeah, but yeah, the, yeah. The real place is Santa Cruz, which for a brief time, I think it was truly the murder capital, capital of, the world. Of, of California or maybe the country or who knows. Yeah, but, um, so true. Right yeah, the way they it was good. Made that dark energy. And then you had, of course, Corey Feldman. That's yeah, uh, half of the Frog, Frog Brothers. Brothers there. Yeah. That's just such <laughs> a good. good movie. Yeah, and it's so neat too. I mean, all the little things in there. Like I said, when they're in, doing the bridge the, and they're the, hanging. The soundtrack. Oh my God. Yeah, the that's bridge. That's such an intense with the fog again, with the mist and the fog. I'm telling yeah. you, it's in the fog. And then and, that hangout that they had, it had yes. been like an old uh, hotel. hotel from back in the early 1900s. Yeah. That had slid off the the coast or above the the coast there, and slid down into the ground into a cavern there, and they had taken it over and all the that was so neat. Into, yeah. I want a place like I want to live there. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? And and it was like they have like posters of Jim Morrison and other things up there. That was like you know kind of crazy, but, but it gave like that, that whole that's in excess song. I can't remember. The, is it little I, sister, I don't remember. Yeah, little sister. That was yeah, just such sister. a haunting. Yeah, yeah. And then the way yeah. Michael Hutchins ended up and everything, it just. Oh yeah. That oh, yeah. that movie is it's one of those that sets the tone for that time. And period. it had it all. It had once you invite the vampire in, it renders you helpless, helpless, because he did invite him in, and you know nothing worked on him. So the garlic didn't work that they tried to get him with. The you know all the holy water, whatever. And you hadn't heard that one much before. Um, once you invite somebody in, yeah, but not that it rendered you helpless. And it just, and you know, all these different. Same era. It was goofy, but it had some part of the folklore, the truth. In it. Fright Night. Have you Fright ever seen Night. that one? Oh, yeah. That was, Fright I mean, Night. It, was, it had some silliness in it, but that was, it had some, some really good uh, vampire lore in there. It did. And it, it had a little of everything, Steve, if I remember correctly. I mean, I think that was one. I don't want to say it was the first one, but it was darn close to being the first one that started to uh, have uh, Dracula turn it into a wolf as well. 
I think this is it. Let's see. Wait a minute. A couple more. I had a lot of those movies up here. For those who weren't here last night, I wanted to show them. There's another one, uh, Steve. That one right there. Look at there. Yep. Yep. Horace Dark Shadows. Yeah. That was the movie that Barnabas Collins. Barnabas and, Collins. Uh, that had Coast, a little everything. Coastal Maine, just up the road here. Uh, Collinwood. That was Collins that's there supposedly it is. based on the Collins family who are part of, uh, if you read Fritz Springmeyer's book, Bloodlines of the Illuminati, the Collins family did exist there you in go. Uh, the eastern United States. And that show was basically paying homage to the Collins family that are behind the scenes that, that run everything. There you go. There you go. Yep, part of the I'm telling you, we got a little of that tonight, too, with the Medici family. And I'll tell you something. If you don't know the Medici family, when you say that, the Rothschilds go like this. That's how big the you see what yeah. I'm saying? Right up there with with all of them. So here's the poster for Fright Night. And and see down here at the bottom, it's got the wolf. Yep. And yeah, he could change into a wolf, but right. Bat. I know the yep. he had uh, evil Ed there. That's <laughs> yeah. What a character he was. And then uh is that Roddy or Malcolm McDowell that played the the TV show, the the horror host? Roddy McDowell uh Roddy, Roddy McDowell played the yeah, TV host, I think it was. Yeah. Um and so the, he goes to Brewster goes to him and is like, you got to help us. He's like, I, I have a TV show. I don't know anything about vampires. Here, let me give you an <laughs> autograph. They're like, no, you understand. You have to help us. If you haven't seen Fright Night, please watch it. You'll love Go it. see and, it. And the chat is saying it was Roddy. Roddy, yep. yep. Yeah, they're no relation, but I always get those two mixed up. Yep, there you go, Roddy. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, Black Eyed Kids. You know what? Yes. I, I don't thing. know. They the same have to thing. Be invited in. If you've got a welcome mat, throw it away. But there's got to be something on that side that dwells in that darkness and that realm of whatever the hell it is that a lot of these rules apply. I can't, I can't explain it. So, Lost Boys, and I'm going to tell you real quick that they're it's doing, like AJK was saying it's a mockery of Christianity and, and all that's holy. Yep. Absolutely. That there's true. an aspect of that in there, too. Oh, yeah. Big time. Uh, Lost a lot. JRG, that's another good one. We got that. I downloaded that one the other night. We haven't watched it yet. She hasn't seen it. The kid you at know, the window. There's enough age difference in us that I've seen a lot of these movies that, oh, She's you got to see seen. this. You got to see that. Yeah. So Prince of Darkness. Whole, Prince of Darkness is another one. Pull a, that one out. Ghost of Mr. Chicken lined up, too. Do you remember that one with Don yeah, that, Knotts? That's fantastic. Love that movie. And if you're going to watch that one, a good uh, double header would be. Um, uh, the incredible Mr. Limpet. Yeah. At the same time, that was a good one. And maybe and, uh, Abbott uh, and Costello night and do the time of their lives and uh, and Abbott and Costello well, meet the Frankenstein and uh, the, the mummy. The time and, of their lives. That's one of the best secular explanations of ghosts and hauntings ghosts. That, that I've ever seen. And it's a comedy. It's Abbott and Costello. Yep. For, for so good. Sake. They got and it right in 1938, and we're still trying to figure it out. And they got it right in 1938. We showed it yep. here on this channel. Yep. And so Lost Boys, the news on Lost Boys, real killers. quick. Um, yeah. They're doing uh, a remake, not a remake. Yeah. If you hear that they're doing a remake, it's yeah, not yeah. a remake. Run the other it's way. <laughs> if it's a remake. No, this is real. They're doing you're hearing now that they are doing a remake of the Lost Boys, but it is not a remake. I did research on it because it bugged the hell out of me. Like, leave it alone. It's perfect. They're not, they're doing an origin movie of well, how be they good. became. Lost Boys, and I love that. So let's see. Let's hope. Cross your fingers. They cast it right, and they do it right, and it's not some kind of junk they're trying to throw down our throats. And they just talk vampires. That would be yeah. I don't. Beautiful. I don't like remakes. Just leave. The I don't either. Alone. Leave it alone. This but was if it's great. An origin story. That would be great. Yeah, it would be. Have you seen this one, Steve? Near Dark. Near Dark. That's another classic. That's a good one. It's a good one. Uh, this was good. The dawn. This was uh, good. I haven't seen Thirty Days a Night, but I've heard you got to watch about it. it. Well, it's vampires in Alaska. Vampires series. in Alaska. Yeah, literally, you have thirty, 30 damn nights. <laughs> yeah, it's all day. All all day is all night. <laughs> it's yeah. terrible, but it's a really good movie. Um, this one I just watched the other day. This is John Carpenter's Vampires, and this is James Woods plays the lead. 
It's that really, really good. And this one really does delve back into the origin stories of the the, the vampire, uh, immortal vampire with all the abilities, the supernatural, you know, Mammy Jahambi, the whole, that vampire. And, um, and this goes all the way back to Valak and Val, or Valak, that if you look what's, into. What's the one? It's a little bit lighter, but it's where the vampires are. Are stuck in the, the bar out in the desert. It's uh, Dust you know, till dawn. Tarantino. Yeah. Dust till dawn. Quentin Tarantino. Tarantino. Uh, that's amazing. It's uh, another one a lot of people don't it's remember. Selma it's called Hyatt. Life Force. That's Life Force is from 1985 and it's about a spaceship and intergalactic vampires. Mm -hmm. It takes the, the whole thing and kind of it turns is. it on its head. That, that's a really good one. Yep. Yep. And, you know, again, uh, the James Wood ones, the John Carpenter's vampire, that one goes um, back, gives you some truth with going back to the origin of uh, what you hear about the vampire. I don't know about the whole exorcism part, but the, the, how he became uh, basically that, possessed. Gary Oldman is just, that's an yep. amazing movie. Oh, this uh, is it right here. This is the other one is, is the, one. Uh, the hunger. With, That's a uh, good David, one. David Bowie and Catherine Deneau and That's um, crazy. Yeah. Susan Sarandon. And that's based on Whitley Strieber's novel, The Hunger. Mm -hmm. And it's that, that's worth that's watching good. too. Yeah, there's so many really good ones, but one's talking about really going back to the Dracula and the Bram Stoker and the origins of that coming from you know, that little party, the same one that brought you Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and you know, everybody was sitting around and Basically, it was, um, uh, gosh, what was it? Was it Lord? It wasn't Lord Byron. Was it Byron? I can't remember. Oh, shoot. Let me go back and find out real quick. Remember. I've got it right here. Uh, do, 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 do. It's this one. The first story written down. Here we go. Oh, that's Ron again. Here we go. Uh, the Vampire, spelled P. Y-R-E was first published anonymously in 1819 by this young man right here. Yeah, it was Byron. I'm, I'm, I should have yeah. I should have believed me. John Palladori. Now, what happened was Lord Byron was one of these fancy dudes. Ran around, got a carriage, horse and carriage, and they're going, they're traveling. They're going back and forth. And he picks up this guy uh, who was interested in learning from Lord Byron what he was teaching. I can't be 100% sure. But I do know that they um, <laughs> they uh, traveled around. And he was kind of like an apprentice, almost like a ballet, a traveling buddy, all that kind of stuff. And he was growing a little, uh, um, getting on, on Lord Byron's nerves at this point. And this guy right here, the, uh, John Palladori, had a little bit of a crush on Mary Shelley, who was with her boyfriend. And uh, her name wasn't Shelly at that time. She was engaged to the guy she was with. And this guy decided he was going to have a crush on her. Lord Byron teased him about it to the point of even daring him to jump over a wall and run down a hill and, and assist her up, the, uh, uh, up to the front door with her packages or whatever the heck. This guy takes the bait, does it, and breaks his ankle. And Lord Byron just teases him the whole time about it. So you can imagine being up in the mountains, you're far from nowhere, uh, traveling is not as easy as, you know, getting in and getting out kind of thing. And uh, this kind of guy, this guy's stuck in trying to think of what to do next. And Lord Byron's trying to get rid of him. So they're up there in this thing, trying to um, amuse each other. And they're sitting around one evening and Lord Byron gets out a book of old German ghost tales. And he starts telling them with all his theatrics and he's doing voices and it's real entertaining. And it's a big deal. And there's a lot of jealousy in the room because the, the dude's good. And this John guy, um, they kind of back and forth in it, kind of going at each other about, well, you know, I bet I could tell a story, whatever. And that's where it comes up. The bet is on and the challenge is on. And Lord Byron has the idea of everybody go write a ghost story. Go write a scary story. Go write something. Kind of a lot like Steve and I did with Cabin 22. And, uh, you know, just let's see if we can do it. And they went off. And, of course, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. She wrote another one, the protagonist, which was the almost the um, the teaser for uh, Frankenstein. She went back and she added a lot more to it and made it a full novel. Um, but that it did come out of this. And something else that came out of this was Lord Byron told a story 
that had a couple of tidbits had nothing to do with a vampire or anything like that it had to do with something about uh, one lady living forever and had a secret elixir or something like that and lived on I you know I don't want to make say too much because I'm not 100% but that part was in there something similar to that and this guy writes a story about a lady who gets caught very much like Chloe of what's that plantation Steve um Chloe he was listening they cut off her ear because she was Myr listening. Myrtle's, Myrtle's Myrtle, plantation. There you go, Myrtle's Plantation. So she's looking through the keyhole and gets caught eavesdropping on, on uh, other people in the house. And she's damned forever to have her face look like a skull, you know, with just skin pulled tight over it. And this was her yeah. punishment. And he made a scary story like that. Lord Byron finally kicks him out the next day and says, be gone, I can't handle you anymore. And, you know, he says great things in his letters about him. And I'm telling you this whole story to get the idea of where Dracula comes from. And Lord Byron doesn't know what else to do. So he sits down to show them all and writes a story called da -da 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 -da, Vampire. A tale. Love it. A tale. And Edna, sorry, you're feeling poorly. I love sorry, it. Sorry, prayers for you. We'll, we'll, we'll pray for you tonight. Love you, sweetheart. Uh, just Love while I'm life. thinking of it, there's another vampire movie from, I believe, 77. George Romero. It's called Martin. It's about a, a young boy that believes he's a vampire. And it's just, it's got the mythos in there, but it's just kind of, oh, wow. it's different. It's a very, so different. very odd what, movie. What year? What year Martin, is that? I believe it's, I want to say 77, George Romero. Oh, okay. Martin. It's a different kind of vampire I had movie. not heard, I had not heard that one. I had not heard that one. I'll have to look it up. And he, I think um, that thinks he's a vampire and he, he gets women and gives them sedatives, knocks them out, and then he bleeds them like with a razor blade and drinks their blood. Oh my god, isn't that awful? <laughs> I mean, it's just I mean, we say it, we say it because we're so used to look. Steve and I have been up to our necks in true crime. I know it sounds awful, but doing research on psychic investigations and you know, uh, trying it's it's an absolutely amazing i'm gonna tell you again sensing murder knock you on your right on your ass i'm telling you because these these psychics have it down he's telling you what the guy's thinking when he's doing he's telling what she's thinking where it is they take them to the place it happened blind they have no idea where they are they're in a car turn left turn right go straight and they take them right to where it happened. They take them right where the body is. In a lot of cases, finding it. And they even described like how the body was displayed and what would be found near it. There was Everything. one lady I read about where the police took her into custody because they're like, yep. you knew so much about the crime and the crime scene that you have to be involved, but she wasn't. Yep. And doing this much research and staying this muddy in, in this horrible trying to pull the light out of this darkness isn't easy guys so <laughs> we have to go in some dark places to get this information so please forgive steve and i if we just roll it off the tongue and go yay cut out his heart and ate it <laughs> and move on it's not that we don't have feelings about it it's just that you know you kind of get jaded on this and we have to say the things because again if i omit facts from the origins of a vampire even if it contains some pretty horrific things and it does or a crime like Velisca or lizzie borden or or the mcdonald case or any of the horrible stuff i've delved into that's i'm not doing my job you know all, right. all i can do is warn you ahead of time and say disclaimer if you're squeamish see you tomorrow you know where we're going to do the lighter side of whatever um you, you see what i'm saying I don't want to get anybody, uh, you know, upset, but if you're interested in knowing what actually happened. So when you're listening to a podcast and a podcaster says that, you know, Abraham Lincoln's mom was a vampire and he's been a vampire slayer ever since, you'll know it's complete and total bullshit. That's my job. And if you, and if you do that with a subject or you do that with a true crime or, or something along those lines or some mystery, then I've done, I've done good here. You see what I mean? But I can't go around omitting stuff because I don't know what fact is going to be important to you down the. Yep. That's a hundred percent. Correct. You know, and I'm kind of leading everybody in. We're like the Pied Pipers here. Kind of we're leading you all into this dark stuff, but that's why I give you videos with happy music and cartoons, dancing and animals, you know, making funny faces and stuff to, to give you the light. We start out with the light. We go into the darkness and we go, we leave in the light again. You know, does that make sense? So, yep. 
There it is. So yeah, I mean, uh, there's, there's a lot of there was vampirism here in America. There's this too. one. There's oh, yeah. uh, that's set in New Orleans. Uh, there's yep. a case that we're looking into in Rhode Island about Mercy Brown, a little girl who uh, died of tuberculosis. Yep. But they they dug her up and she's still her hair had grown. She still had blood in her mouth and in her body, and uh, they they burned her heart and uh, fed it to her little brother. He died. It anyway. was sick. But, but that was, was four the, years later, Steve. Yeah. There, four there, there years was later. Years, this guy, this is how twisted people. Yeah. This is how twisted people can be, folks. You know, this is why facts are important. And that's why looking at actual history, because they're not teaching this in schools. But, you know, that's why it's important, right? You know, we're tired of being lied to. Let's put the truth on the table. Let's yeah. look, look at right there in the friggin' eye. And then huge done. vampire panic in New England back in yeah. the 1800s. Four that's years. something Nicole and I are working on. Yeah, that's incredible. And then to, to be so, what do you call it, Steve? Uh, vampire panic? To be yeah. so uh, caught up in your superstition or whatever, the common sense goes right out the damn window. And you think that your son is sick because of something your daughter had four years ago, that you're going to dig her up, cut her up, take her heart out, burn it, mix it with herbs and the ashes and put it in a little pumice rock. Can you imagine why you're actually doing this and put it in a, a an elixir for this kid? Because they thought that she was a vampire coming to suck his life force out. And no. that's what was making him sick. Perfect sense. <laughs> Amazing, it's, not huh? the only, it's not the only one, Steve. No. Uh, it really it started like in the late 1700s and went into the 1800s. The big, I mean, tuberculosis was rampant. Yep. But the odd thing, though, was that it was... She had been buried, like you said, I believe it was four years. They dug her up. Mm -hmm. She had fresh blood in her mouth and in her uh, heart. And that's why they thought it was true it's, that she was a vampire. It's the townsfolk so were the ones that insisted on the exhumation. But, but did it? You know, like you look back and you think, okay, knowing human beings, you know, uh, you know, how reliable is that eyewitness report? You know what I mean? Did it get changed? Was it a game of telephone yeah. or did it actually happen? Was it more than one person that saw that? Because I, I you know, really, um, when they dug up Lincoln, we can talk about stuff that body went through. I think like four times they tried to steal his body, moved it. I think it was four times. Go back. I mean, hell, man, I did like 13 hours on that with Donnie Cho. So it's in there. But they, they um, when they pulled him up, everybody around him, they were so in sync with the retelling of their visual, I guess maybe because it was such a, an honor. I mean, they took their hats off and <gasps> took a deep breath and just kind of held their breath and not out of fear, but out of reverence. You know what I mean? And everybody said the same thing that when they opened, he had a light, uh, a light white fuzzing, almost like a peach all over his whole body there had been some kind of a fungus like a mold but just yeah. light enough to be like the the cotton you know a fine cotton and everybody explained it this way and the flag had decomposed on him in tiny little uh pieces of just color that was left of this faded colored flag that if a wind blew the whole thing would go and at just a moment in time and he was so preserved because he had been on that train steve for all that time with two embalmers sitting right next to him riding in the train coach the whole time imagine having that job and they embalmed him every every town every city <laughs> they kept touching him up that he was so good he was like mummified completely mummified almost like a wax mummy of of himself it was incredible yeah. so when you hear that you can almost you can almost on the emotion and the synchronicity of the retelling of each eyewitness, you can kind of, yep, it happened just like that. But digging up mercy, people are panicked and they want to tell it and they go down to the bar and add a little more. You know what I mean? So how fresh, you know what I mean? How fresh was the blood? It could have yeah. very well been because if it was, then there was something going on. But that, that's one of, according to the internet, that's one of the best documented cases of the exhumation of a corpse in order to perform rituals to banish an undead manifestation. There you go. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's incredible. That, that's, that's mob rules right there. The family yeah. didn't want any part of it, but the village of uh, wow. Exeter insisted you know, I, on. I wonder, Steve, maybe you can answer this too. 
uh, they showed this, and I thought about it when I saw it, in John Carpenter's uh, Vampires. The master vampire is, of course, that valet guy. And um, he does the whole telepathic calling of his coven, you know, into the nest. You know, yeah. these words that they use. And uh, they're meant to cringe, and they do. And he's calling them all in. So each time they go to, you know, go to sleep and get back up again, there's more of them. But this is how they're sleeping. They're not going in a, an old abandoned house or some hotel that fell in a crevice, you know, from whatever era. They're just laying down on the ground and covering themselves up with dirt. They just sink into the ground and they're covered with dirt. So when they all get up, he gets up first and then they all just start coming out of the ground around him. It's 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 effective, you know, visually. Yeah. And they're filthy. By the time they walk a couple blocks down the street, their hair is back in place. They got great makeup on. Their clothes are clean. So you kind of go, is that supposed to be a thing that they're doing? Or is it just bad cinematography? I don't think John <laughs> Carpenter does anything by accident. I, I think he's think trying so. to tell me that he's they're doing this telepathically. Those, uh, like Stanley Kubrick, every single thing. Yeah. The they're materializing this way. meant to be there. They're materializing. This is this how they want to appear. And, you know, they, they're they sleeping in the dirt all night, coming up filthy. But, you know, they take 10, you know, 25 yards of uh, uh, walking. They're right back to where they, you know, camera ready. You know, they could do the cover of a magazine. So, I, you know, again, people say, would you what would you rather be, a werewolf or a vampire? And, you know, you got to kind of weigh it all. It's like, do I have to choose between those two? I mean... Because I'm from Universal Werewolf, the, the sadness. I felt yeah. so sorry for that guy. He didn't want anything to do with it. He's all the way up while we were kids. Anyway, they were yeah. begging you to chain him to the damn bed or the closet. They're yeah. you know putting chains on and stuff. Please don't let me kill. The the moon is going to change, and I don't want to do this. And they're just howling. It's so pitiful. They sound like an injured whale. God help them, you know. And they're just wailing out of just horror even american world War from london now that's a good one that's where you really saw a good changing over from human to to werewolf yeah, in and american was, world War from london yeah that's a thing that, thank that you cathita thank you sweetheart of uh, a lot of the, oh you're welcome you see nothing movies. yet poor old larry talbot he just his brother died he went back to wales to reconcile with his father and and inadvertently became and he didn't want to do that he didn't want to be that creature and that, yeah. that's where the 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 pathos came into that story. Yeah. Yeah. If I had to that's pick, a, I'd be a vampire because they can change into a wolf too. So there you go. And a bat, and they fly, yeah. and you know they can be invisible. Uh, you, can, you never get a bad picture because you don't show up in camera. Um, you don't have to worry about looking in the mirror no more. I don't know how they wind up looking so good if they can't see themselves in the mirror. But uh, a lot of them really got with, themselves with that together. Movie, but there's some there's some creatures the, the too. Man, I like this works. guy in the chair. I think that's a good look. I could pull that off. Wolfman, I mean, and that was what 1941. Which one? You had the Wolfman 1941. Oh um, gosh, I don't know. You, you had. I had studied Don, that Don, one. Don Junior's You had Bela Lugosi. You had Claude Rains. I mean, it's just. Oh yeah. For that time, you could. Lon Chaney Junior. Yeah. Lon Chaney Junior. We did that with uh, when we did Lon Chaney, and we did uh, 1923, and the oldies and stuff we've learned so much on this channel together steve yeah we have. we've we've learned so much i mean we're like paranormal walking encyclopedia whatnot <laughs> like a, but more like an adult coloring but, book between us we have adult color book between us we've got over 100 years of knowledge and experience so there, there you, you go. go and it's like an adult coloring book that's kind of sort of colored like you know, like you and I have gone through and put put some colors that we like, but we're we never felt committed to finish a whole picture, so we just left that for everybody else to fill in and put their colors in there too, because this doesn't belong to us. This information is for everybody. Isn't that a beautiful way of putting that? Don't you it love is. coloring? It really is. Don't you love coloring? Yeah, that's a good I like analogy. the names. I like the names of crowns. I want that job. You know, yeah. clown nose red macaroni and cheese. I'm going to lunch. You know. <laughs> Who has that fucking job? And for the longest time growing up, I'm gonna I swear to you this happened. Now I don't tell this to everybody, so don't tell anybody. I don't want this getting around. But when I was a little girl, there used to be a crown that was a real dark brick red, and it was called Indian red. 
And I could not understand for the life of me, being a little girl, it was part Cherokee, part Lenape. Well, how the hell we got this color? I'm like, I don't know that we used a lot of this color. I don't understand where they get off calling it that. It took me forever to figure out it was the dot in the head kind. Yeah. Different Nobody was helping me. I was on my own with a box of 124s. You know what I mean? Yeah. So nobody told me nothing. And now I believe that they've changed a lot of them. Aren't they politically correct now? I you think can't they're say. politically correct now. Uh, you no longer have Lord flesh. Knows what they flesh are. is peach, I think, now. And uh, the, there's different different colors than, than what you know, we grew it, up you, with. That one I agree with because I've always felt bad. I had a really good, uh, some really good friends. And everybody, it seems to me when I look back, was a different shade of something. You know? And we didn't know it did. We're just friends. You know, we're little, yeah, little we, kids. We're, we're little we, fucking kids. We but had I, friends every color in the crayon box almost. I remember going through the Band-Aid box when a friend of mine cut his arm, his elbow, and I ran in the house to get a Band-Aid. And I'm looking through the box, and I said, I'm looking for Jeremy's color. <laughs> I said, because it's not right for him to put this white old Band-Aid on. I mean, everybody can see it. The whole point is it's supposed to. I knew enough. To know that the purpose of having a band aid that color was so you didn't, you kind of hid your wound. You didn't want the world to see that you had a boo boo. You now know? they have the clear ones that kind of, yeah. In. We didn't have cartoon band aids. We had none of that shit. We were, no. we were Poe. You understand? We were lucky to have a band aid. And I don't think it was called really band aid back then. It was like an adhesive strip or it was something. No. Band aid, band aid still had you, a little if red you didn't string. Have a band-aid, you took a piece of Kleenex or paper towel and you masked it. Piece tape of duct tape. Yeah, mask it. I've done that before. <laughs> I've, I've made my own band aids when I was a kid. Uh, my, yep. my mom's going to yell at me if I go in and get blood and everything. Let's see what's in the garage. Yep. Here, there's a piece some of an caulk. old rag. Some caulk. Some, uh, some masking tape. <laughs> super glue. We didn't have super glue back then. You can't Elmer's glue a cut close. I'm here to tell you, folks. <laughs> I've tried it. We'd when slap. I'll tell you what we did slap in it, those spider webs. That was something Native American used to. And my my grand grannies would still talk about doing that. You want to talk about running across the cellar floor. I ain't going down and get one of them things. You put it in my cut, you know. But I always felt bad that the band-aids didn't match. You know, that was something that bothered me. I was like, everybody should have one. You know, I totally agree with that stuff. Or make them clear. Or just make them work. You know, stop being so focused on things and just make them work. Well, they've you know? got the ones down like the liquid band-aids. You just squirt it on and it solidifies a little bit. You know you what? Know, and that's the best. That. That's the best. I mean, for the right wound. You know, we could talk about wound bandages. We need to do like a civil war. We need to use bandages through the times. We could do <laughs> we can do it, Steve. You know, you and I could pull that off. We, we could make it we can make it <laughs> if put put some of that to get get one of those dancing bandages, like a dancing band-aid, and put some music. We'd have us a good old time. So let's talk about look this at guy. All the cartoon characters they've had since then. Yeah. Oh and, my god. Uh, the ones with the bananas on them and, and all this other stuff. It was, you know, later, and like when my daughter was little, it's a fun thing. Oh, it's a band aid. It's fun. You know, it's got cartoons, it's got Ren and Stimpy or something on it. Here you go. Yeah. Yeah. Ren and and uh, yeah. Kind of make you well, forget that you're the spider web. It looks bleeding out of you. If you can get you a clean one, it doesn't have a lot of dust or whatnot on it. Now, normally you wouldn't take this out of your granny's, you know, cannon cellar, you know what I mean? Because they're dusty and dirty, whatever. But Native Americans would use them clean off tree of the dew of the morning. Yeah. Those big Still old garden them. spiders, hey. the big green and black ones, if you yeah. could find one of those, that's what it coagulates the wound and, and cauterize. Yeah, well, it doesn't it's cauterize kind of like it. Nature's gauze, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. And you just put it all in the wound and it all sticks to it and it comes together. It's all natural. Like I said, as long as you can get a clean one, but I guarantee you they put something on it. For an and leave the spider Antibi out antibiotic as well. Yeah, don't put the well, spider. Did in. you ever put tobacco on a bee sting or a, mm -hmm. a bug bite? Yep, yep. You'd be surprised. I never got works. stung by a wasp. Honey, honey my was uncle another one. Ground up a cigarette and or probably took Prince Albert out of a can, mm -hmm. wet the tobacco and had me hold it on my arm to draw the poison out. I don't there know if go. it worked or not, but it, and and honey too. Honey was another one that they used, but um. All right, dude. Well, I'll tell you what. I know you probably got to get up and walk your knee for a minute because we sit here in pain. You just wouldn't even know. We get up and we like <laughs> read, readjust our braces and our crutches and our slap some more Bengay on and get back on with the yeah, show. I did something to my knee before I left uh, New Mexico. I was going out one morning. I was taking Mulder out and didn't have the lights on. It was still dark out. And I 
misjudged the last step and stepped off into nothing. And being, I, I was a semi-pro skateboarder back in the seventies. I realized, uh Oh, there's not anything under me. So I jumped kind of did a bail. And when I did, I twisted my knee and it's still give me, it's better today than it has been. But, um, well, you can get up and walk it around here. In yeah, just I'm a second. Get up in a minute. So, I need to go to the bathroom too. It's been sitting here. All right. Pounding down Dunkin' Donuts, which is oh, Dunkin' Coffee. And that's a thing here in New England. There's I've only seen one Starbucks, but I, I can throw a rock and hit two or three different hit a Dunkin', Dunkin Donuts. Donuts. Yeah. And I found a place like Lewis Black was talking about Starbucks. I found the end of the universe. There's a Dunkin' Donuts across the street from a Dunkin' Donuts. You come out of Dunkin' Donuts and, boy, that was good. But what I could really use is another cup another of coffee. Donut. Oh, I'll just walk right over You're here. Right across the street. That's crazy. But, uh, they have good All coffee. Right. All right, guys. So this guy, this is, of course, New Orleans. And this is uh, uh, St. Germain. And the whole thing about him is he was seen all through multiple centuries. I went back and the earliest is supposedly... In some stories, Moses handed him the staff that he climbed uh, Mount Sinai with. Okay. This, I mean, this goes back and believe what you want or follow what line of timeline for him. The whole thing is people would see him in court. He would always show up at these lavish parties, in different time timelines, and people would see him and they'd, they'd spend days with him, you know, because when people go to these parties on these big resorts and mansion and, you know, castles, whatever, they stay for a couple of days. They don't just go party and leave, you know. So a lot yeah, of times they, they they're hanging out, you get playing, stay, yeah. yeah, croquet, they're play, you know, going to dinner, they're walking around talking BS and all this other stuff. So they would spend time with him and then see him 40 years later and he looked exactly the same. It Not is like Saint Germain. Cage. <laughs> it is froze. It is. Yeah. So that's the whole thing about this guy. People would see him and he'd look exactly the same. They said that nobody ever really saw him eat much. Like he would throw a lavish party, but he wouldn't be eating. He'd be talking. Uh, very little to drink. Um, he said that he ate very small bits of food throughout the day and little bits of uh drink throughout the day. Is that enough to cause longevity? Who knows? Did he have a secret? He was an alchemist. He was a, a, a mathematician genius. He knew, uh, I think, like every European language there was fluently. He could talk over history like he had been there and the detail. So all of this just circulated, much like when Ben Franklin went to France and was over in Europe and was going around scuttlebutting with everybody and everybody, this the word just spread. And he was seen all over the place th throughout time. And weird things would be said about him. Like in some cases, people said they would catch him almost gliding into a room yeah. where where they and, didn't really they see his claim that he was the Count of St. Germain, who had entertained European royalty centuries past. Right. And in, in the paintings and stuff from that era, he looked just like he did when they saw him in 20th century New Orleans. Exactly. I mean, that was like the big thing with him. Let me see. If and if you think about that, if you were immortal, you'd have time to learn everything you wanted to learn. You could read every book. Yep. That'd oh, be yeah. A great, that'd be a great yep. problem to have. Yep. And that's where he got all this education, right? So as you see here, it, I took it through. This is the many faces right here. I can't stop it in time. Bam. There we go. It's partial anyway. And he's so also all this one of through the time. People that supposedly been encountered on Mount Shasta. Where people claim to run into somebody calling themselves Saint Germain. On he Mount would Shasta, disappear. It would he give would, people universal knowledge. He would disappear. Like he would be he'd turn to go down a hallway and turn around and talk to him, he'd be gone. Uh different things like that. Yes, this is him. Um, there was many portraits throughout time with this guy, but um something else. I mean, absolutely. Um, I mean, there's accounts in 1350. There's, you know, this is one that was done in France of him. And of course, like you bring in all these little things like, all right, there's an exaggeration here. There's an exaggeration there. Absolutely. You got to count for that. But it's the similarities throughout time with this guy. And the big thing was this. 
Now I'm going to give you the end of the story before I give you the beginning, because you got to know why this guy is thought to be such a creep. Somewhere along the lines of that three o'clock in the morning. Now this guy would throw these lavish parties. People would come from everywhere to go. But again, like I said, they didn't see him eat a lot. They didn't see him drink a lot. Okay. He would always hire a lot of prostitutes. That was one of the big things with him. All these prostitutes coming in and out, in and out, in and out, which he had the money to pay for. Wealthy beyond any imagination, this guy. So this is the apartment, basically, that he had. This whole floor here on the, the third floor and the second. You see the balcony around? This was his. It's about three o'clock in the morning, very similar to the first story that Steve and I told you with the Carter brothers. Okay. Not far from this on the, just the other street parallel behind this. So new Orleans, I'm telling you, this girl is heard screaming, popping out of one of these doors. The guy across the street, Caesar, he's on the balcony smoking. And I mean, new Orleans never sleeps. It's like New York. She comes battling out of there. She's wearing what you would wear back in those times. This is what, uh, 19, early 19 something. Because again, he was in New Orleans, even that far up. So she's running out of the balcony and she's screaming. She's got blood on her arm. She's got blood on her neck. That She's wearing that white kind of fluffy undergarments that you would wear with the buttons up the front, like a step in. And that's covered in blood. And she's screaming that this guy is a vampire. Much like the chick on the plane was saying that MF is not for real. Kind of <laughs> like that. So she's running up and down this balcony. She runs out this end door here by the end, by the, uh, the, the corner, the curve. She goes down to the end of the thing. She's screaming, this guy is a vampire. She's using the words and she's screaming it over and over again. Jumps off the balcony and supposedly... Now you've got more than one witness. I believe there was three or four at this point because of the screaming. They come out, they go to the window, whatever. And more than one person said that they saw Count St. Germain in his undergarments jump off the balcony, land right next to her without missing a beat, and started to grab under her arm and lick the blood off. Here's the guy scream on the balcony. What the are you doing get off of her whatever he says he sees that somebody sees him and he runs up the street and the guy said he just disappeared running up the street disappeared off into nowhere did he turn was it foggy i don't know it was night this is the story he does not show up that night the cops go in they get her into the police station, much like the other girl, which is why I really had to research the two because I'm like, one's too much like the other. But they go into the house and they go in, they're looking all around. They see that everything she said looked like it happened. There was a tussle, a fight or struggle. They go into the kitchen and there's no food. All there is no is food, bottles no and utensils. bottles of wine. No, no, yeah, just bottles of wine. And that now they have to take it all into custody. Who knows what they thought they were going to do with it, the cops. And one of the bottles falls on the floor and breaks. And it's not all wine, folks. It's red wine mixed with blood. And they uncorked several bottles and they were all like that. 100% true. So there's some kind of something going on with this dude. Was he a vampire? Was he immortal? Was he an alchemist who just found the fountain of youth, found some kind of formula? I don't know. Or did he just have a taste for blood and wine? Right. <laughs> and prostitutes. So, <laughs> so there you go. That almost sounds like a rock and roll band. Blood, wine, and prostitutes. See? <laughs> so <laughs> there's your some of your heavy metal albums and your, your black-eyed uh, centerfold girls, whatever. So anyhow... I, Steve and I are, are at an absolute conundrum on this. I don't know what he was. Do you, Steve? No idea. So we had to turn. But he to was something. Point. He's very charismatic and was able to convince he the police. Was oh, no, nothing like that. Then he so I'm going to go up. ahead and admit that I don't know. Steve is going to say he doesn't know. There's something funky going on. So I had to turn to a higher power for some answers. And yes, I turned to Leonard Nimoy. In search of the man who wouldn't die. Steve, go walk your knee. We're going to roll that beautiful beam further. You ready? 
Let's go. Here we go. Look at the date. These are all sightings of him. The wonder man of Europe runs for his life. No records exist of his birth, death, or true identity. He was considered a genius in art, music, politics, and alchemy. Although he looked 40, many believed he was at least 150 years old. He called himself the Count of Saint Germain. Others called him the man who would not die. The court at Versailles in 1757 rides the last great crest of regal splendor before the French Revolution. Embroiled in a bitter war with England, King Louis XV still plays host to the leading thinkers and doers of Europe. The Count of Saint Germain is welcomed as a man of wealth and obvious breeding. A brilliant violinist, he conducts entire symphonies without referring to written music. He is also a talented painter, and his descriptions of ancient history cause listeners to believe that he experienced the events himself. In recreations based on actual memoirs, Saint Germain fascinates the elite of France, including Voltaire, Madame Pompadour, and especially King Louis. I liked and admired the man. In his way, he was brilliant. A scientist and a historian. He amused and astounded me. Why, once he removed a large flaw from this very beautiful diamond and uh, tripled its worth. <laughs> I set him up in a laboratory at the Trianon. He used to teach me chemistry. He even said I had a natural aptitude for it. During years spent in India, Saint Germain supposedly learned how to remove flaws from diamonds and change base metals to gold. It was written that he performed both feats often enough to dissuade doubters. Skilled as a chemist, it was also rumored that he possessed a magic elixir of life. Saint Germain neither confirmed nor denied anything said about him. How old was he? 100? 200? 2,000 years? He either smiled or responded with cheerful evasiveness. He spoke at least a dozen languages so fluently that in any country he visited, he was accepted as a native. But where was he actually from? Portugal, Egypt, Atlantis. The fog shrouded Carpathian mountains of Transylvania have hidden many legendary figures. One might have been Saint Germain as a small boy. When Prince Franz Rakoczy lost control of Hungary, his two older sons were placed under house arrest in Vienna. His third son, possibly Saint Germain, traveled secretly from Transylvania to Florence and the protection of the House of Medici. If this story, one of so many, is true, it would explain Saint Germain's extraordinary education and appreciation of fine art. According to memoirs, the Count was slim, well-proportioned, and of medium height. His features were pleasant, and his eyes possessed a great fascination. Those who looked into them were profoundly influenced. His sense of humor and courtly manner made him especially attractive to women. Among them, King Louis's mistress, Madame Pompadour. He was a truly delightful person, and he knew all of the European languages. And he was very entertaining. 
The king, you know, is easily bored, but never by Saint-Germain. And yet there was a mystery to him. Nobody knew where he came from or his true identity. And there was a strangeness. Some of my very elderly friends at court said they had known him for 50 years, and yet he never seemed to age. If he had a magic elixir of life, <laughs> I wish he had given some to me. Casanova, the Italian opportunist, resented his rival's success. Saint-Germain is a charlatan and an imposter. He thinks he's a prodigy in everything. Oh, he's very clever. And with his tricks, he has the capability to amuse. He can make the women admire him. But then, I know something of the ladies myself. One very mysterious thing. In all of the banquets we have attended together, I have never seen him eat one morsel of food. While his peers gorged at banquets, Saint Germain dined alone on light portions of cereal, vegetables, and the white meat of chicken. Was this his secret for long life? Small, balanced meals? Voltaire, France's aging intellectual, expressed great admiration for Saint Germain. He is a very learned man in the Freemason. His knowledge of history is so extraordinary it makes one believe he lived through the events himself. One could believe it would take more than one lifetime to absorb so much knowledge. Thus, the man must be immortal. He was so knowledgeable in politics and history that I used to send him on secret missions to make peace with England, but uh, that was my mistake. I went over the head of my foreign minister, who naturally was furious. Of course, I had to pretend that I knew nothing of the affair. Choisel was going to arrest him, but he escaped and disappeared. Envious of Saint Germain's influence on the king, Choisel, Louis's foreign minister, ordered him arrested and shot as an English spy. circulated vicious rumors throughout Europe, claiming that Saint Germain was a Portuguese of questionable parentage who married for money in Mexico and absconded to Turkey with his wife's jewels. Saint Germain escaped to the English Channel and crossed safely to London. However, Choiseul's ugly stories followed him wherever he wandered, even to Russia. In St. Petersburg, Saint Germain joined a conspiracy to overthrow Tsar Peter in 1762. Battlefield strategies brought victory to the forces of Catherine the Great. Once enthroned, the new queen rewarded him with the title General Well Done. The legend of the brilliant count preceded him to the distinguished courts and drawing rooms of Europe. Wherever he traveled, Saint Germain was welcomed as a scholar, a scientist, and raconteur. Most of his activities were shrouded in mystery, but it is known that he formed secret societies dealing with the occult and warned the crowned heads of many nations that the collapse of the French monarchy would eventually doom them as well. His one known manuscript, the Most Holy Trinisophia, written in a combination of modern languages and ancient hieroglyphics, is considered a classic of occult literature. The final years of Saint Germain's known life were spent in Hesse Castle, Germany. He divided his time between experiments in alchemy and meetings of his secret societies. Few people knew Saint Germain as well as Prince Charles, his last known confidant and benefactor. In 1784, word spread across Europe that Saint Germain lay mortally ill in the castle of Prince Charles.
I was privileged to be a very good friend of Saint Germain. In fact, he spent his last years here in this very castle. Some time before he died, he confided in me his true identity. He was the third son of Prince Franz Leopold Rakuzzi of Transylvania. When the Austro-Hungarian Empire absorbed his enormous estates, he spirited his third son away to Italy, where he was uh, looked after and brought up by the Medici family and attended the University of Siena. This, of course, uh, was one of the reasons for his, his very uh, charming uh, demean, his aristocratic uh, bearing, his wealth and his great knowledge. I just had to stop it there for a second because two things. One, it's just a guy telling a story just like everybody. Two, if you wanted to hide and be done, you could fake your death and get a friend to lie for you. Not saying he is, just putting it out there. The big thing, he was raised by the Medici family, as I said earlier. Those who know that know, but that explains an awful lot because if there's anybody that's got any kind of longevity, whether it's being blood transfusions, um, some kind of blood elixir with maybe some, you know, kind of chrome of some kind in it that's known to give you this life force is not just a drug. It's like a, an addiction. It's a, almost like a life force. Um, You've also got pinpoint, I hate to say it, but it's the truth, pinpointed organ transplant. I mean, how many heart transplant did Rothschild have? Anybody know? Many, you know. So how much of that's going on where something breaks down, they just get a new one? They've got nothing but money, time, and influence, and power. So is that something that we need to look at with St. Germain being raised by that family? We also know that many, there's a lot of inbreeding and there's a lot, it's not just the royals that do that, you know, there's a lot of inbreeding and there's a lot of, you raise my kid because that way that kid will have a different name, be raised by a different family, but we know it's the same bloodline. There's a lot of that going on. I'm telling you guys, if you research, you'll find out there's a lot of presidents that that happened with. Because it's a bloodline. You know, blood doesn't lie. Blood tells it. Blood tells the truth. You know, think about it. It's crazy. There's a lot of blood in this. You know, it's 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 kind of with the vampires, it's this this thread that runs through the whole thing, whether we're talking about the the monster cryptidy kind of supernatural creature, that immortality with the the had to be has to be invited in and all that like many other things in the paranormal supernatural world but it's also humans like ron was saying last night humans doing it to humans for their gain with no thought like cattle you know very much like who was the the uh one in uh interview with the vampire um What's his name? That little squeaky young man. What's his name? Tom Cruise. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, he was more of that kind of of that kind of ilk, Steve, wasn't he? He was more like he's trying to tell everybody, "Look, you just got to do it." It's yeah. you know, and and then he made it, of course, because Anne Rice was an erotic author of uh, period and historical romance. And she made her home in New Orleans. Hang on a second. Before, before she wrote Interview with the Vampire. So, of course, it's going to have a lot of that in it. So, he doesn't just bite him. He's, like, telling him how wonderful their skin is and how soft their cheeks are. And then he, he winds them up and then, bam, you know. And he does it with this nonchalant uh, cattle, you know, eat and, <laughs> eat and run kind of thing. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? And so he had that kind of persona where he had just gotten to the point where it was nothing. And I think that's one of the hardest things for us to to get is how people could be that evil and get to that point. 
you know, well, how to serial kill it. You know what I mean? It's all some kind of mind, you know, something got shook up somewhere. Something got broke, put back together wrong. You know what I mean? And it's hard to psychologically unwrap that shit because people get to a point and they break. Our minds are incredible. How many stories have you heard about people that have gone through all kind of hell at a young age or just around them? People are the most, human beings are the most adaptable son of a guns, you know? And I mean, look at the raccoon. All nature is very adaptable, will rise to the occasion, and the survivors will. You know, that's not saying much for those who succumb to whatever it was. They're gone. But the survivors learn from that. You see? Do you see where I'm going? Nope. This whole, it, it's, you know, it's, it's really gross. But to go back, even like Ron was saying last night, to the cave, it was fascinating to hear that, of course, throughout villages, they would, you know, uh, tuck their kids at night, tell them to be good because the boogeyman that comes out of the cave at night is going to get them, you know. And did they use it for, you know, better stay inside, like that whole M. Night Shyamalan village thing where the whole village was kept captive by this invisible fence of lies. If you go outside, the monster will get you. And they would dress up like the monster and come in so that you'd have a sighting every once in a while and really kept the people under control. They started losing it when we started flying airplanes in the sky, though. They pulled it off for a long time. Has anybody seen that? The village? M. Night Shyamalan? That's some crazy propaganda mind control. You, you know what I mean? That's That'll tell you right there. So vampires, this whole thing with vampires used to scare us and uses the boogeyman and things like that. There's people out there drinking freaking blood, people. By choice, for whatever reason, this and guy was caught. That chrome yeah. substance that you talked about, there's a huge, huge market for that among the, the power, powerful and wealthy. You can buy it on the internet. I, I, I shit you not. On the dark web, you can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, not that, you know, ooh, good Lord, you know. And what's this obsession lately, Steve? Have you noticed how many movies, how many shows, how many uh, funny skits, whatever you want to call it along the way, about trying to uh, uh, normalize cannibalism? Absolutely. Uh, re reality shows where chefs are coming out and people are sitting there and you have to you have to tell me what you're eating. It's one of these three things. It's either pork or turtle, or human flesh. Long pig. <laughs> and they're totally serious. And these girls are acting like they don't know. Now, whether this whole thing is acted or what, that's not the point. Who knew what, who was faking, who was jackass, whatever. The point is they did it, and they put it out there. Why are they trying to normalize that? And again, you can say... I can remember in the 70s hearing about the Donner Party, and you could even you could say that name, the Donner Party, and you would actually hear music in your head and surround sound of that. You know, it would be like mm -hmm. that that ominous music in the background that those beats of okay, evil's coming, something, something bad. It's about suspense thriller music, you know, because it was such a taboo to even think about cannibalism or having to eat to stay alive. You know, the, the soccer team crashes, Steve, in the snow and the horrific story of them helping the wounded and this one's dying and they're buried. And so this is such a depressing, we're going to have to dance out of here, Steve, to get this back up, but they're burying the people in the snow and, you know, the the horror, you know, but how through history. And last night, Ron told us they were doing this in this cave because in the wintertime, humans were easier to catch than the regular than animals that were more limber and more used to. It's horrifying to think about, but it's no. easier for us to believe all that's possible than to believe this guy could be lying about St. Germain actually being dead. He's going through an awful lot to say that this guy died, right? We got a little bit left. We're about halfway through. How's your knee, Steve? Doing great. 
All right. I got to get me one of those. Do they have tobacco flavored? Just uh, regular, yeah, uh, just pure, unadulterated, pure is, unadulterated. Uh, Frankenberry. No it's uh, Frankenberry cereal. He's flavor, still on right? that Frankenberry. Yeah, you ain't got you no cow chocula yet? I, I can't find it if they make it. I don't know how they can use the name, but it says Frankenberry cereal on it. Yes, it does. That but, is so pink. Steve, got that another is so one pink. That, uh, it that is. is it, so it looks pink. A little, but it, it, that's the colors of the Frankenberry cereal box. I just can't do it. It upsets me. That color ups I know it sounds crazy, folks, but when you're creative and you're you're an empath and you're around crafts as much as I am and beading and all that kind of stuff, color is important. And, yeah. and flowers and, and, and this color, floral design. That's, I think it's Baker Martin Pink is the name of it. Uh, also known as Drunk Tank Pink. Yeah. They, they it calm, it's supposed to calm you down. It's supposed to calm people down or make you sick. One it has other. the opposite effect to me. It, to me, it's like Pepto-Bismol, which makes me think of nausea. which Because you didn't volunteer to take that shit unless you were sick. Pepto Bismol, you, your mom come at you with a tablespoon and that bottle. Yeah. After she shake it up, and all the bubbles on top. Uh, of coach soothes, protects my ass. Get that away from me. <laughs> mm, 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 nasty. Oh, uh, it's almost as bad as uh, the making the uh, amoxicillin bubble gum flavored. And your mind knows you don't swallow bubble gum, so you don't want to swallow it right out of the gate. And you're, it's a to total mind melt. And you know you have to do it because your earache infection is not going to go away unless you take amoxicillin. And it tastes like nasty, chalky bubble gum. It's, uh. Anyway, I think this guy's telling the fib. What do you think? Shall we yeah. continue, Steve? Let, let's see. Unfortunately, <laughs> he died here in this castle. Did Prince Charles attend the oh, funeral? Shit. No. Now until you come to mention it, I didn't. Uh, I was away at the time. There are no records of St. Germain's burial. Ten years later, he was sighted in Paris at the height of the French Revolution. Sightings continued well into the 19th century, and for some, continued today. Elizabeth Clare Prophet, leader of the Church Universal and Triumphant in Pasadena, California, believes that St. Germain speaks to the world through her. Who was St. Germain is really a very important question for America and for freedom-loving peoples in every nation today. St. Germain has embodied again and again over many centuries as we all have. Our souls continue to evolve and to experience on earth until we perfect our own individual calling. Back in the days of Atlantis, St. Germain figures as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He was tending the flame of freedom in an ancient temple. Word came to him from his teacher that the continent would sink. And he was told to travel from the continent by ship to go to Europe in what is now the area of Transylvania, in the Transylvanian foothills, to plant the flame of freedom. Transylvania was in Hungary and is now in Romania. St. Germain did this, and the placing of that flame of freedom there was the beginning of the house of Rakazi, the royal house of Hungary. According to Mrs. Prophet, this is just the beginning of a series of fantastic lives. Elizabeth Clare Prophet believes that St. Germain has appeared on Earth at key moments in history. After the ascension of Jesus Christ, Joseph of Arimathea traveled by ship to the British Isles with the cup used at the Last Supper. That cup became the spiritual force field for the Knights of the Round Table, the coming of Arthur. In that episode, Saint Germain incarnated as Merlin the Magician. Again, the alchemist, again, the great prophet and seer, the spiritual power behind the throne. He gives the vision to Camelot. And so that focus in England begins the opportunity for Saint Germain to bring the teachings of Christ to the new world. And so he incarnates as none other than Christopher Columbus. The master Saint Germain arrived at the new world at San Salvador, very near the ancient retreat of Atlantis, which had sunk when Atlantis went down 12,000 years earlier. Saint Germain then ascended and he went forth as the immortal very closely connected 
with the courts of Europe. A book has been written about him based on the diaries of Madame Dadimar. And this book contains the record of the Wonder Man of Europe as he appeared and disappeared throughout the courts of Europe over a period continuously over 200 years. He astonished those around him. He appeared uh, youthful. He wore diamonds on every finger. He precipitated jewels. But his main mission was to warn the heads of state of the coming cataclysm that ensued in the French Revolution. All that he predicted came to pass. Still having the desire to form a United States of Europe, he contacted Napoleon to form that unity. But the power transferred to Napoleon, Napoleon misused. He went power mad, and instead, he met his Waterloo. Dr. Peter Ryle, professor of European history at UCLA, holds a different viewpoint. I think Saint-Germain was a typical adventurer of the 18th century. He was a man similar to uh, Casanova, similar to Cagliostro, similar to a whole slew of men who populated the last half of the 18th century, plying the trade of uh, mystical uh, religion, uh, pseudoscience, in an attempt to milk as much money as they could from the rich, the wealthy, and the gullible. Dr. Manuel Oderberg of the Theosophical Society. I feel personally that um, Saint Germain was one of a number of highly trained people who uh, seem to come before mankind or in different countries from time to time to restate certain uh, ethical principles. He had universal ideas about humanity per se rather than any one particular country. And secondly, that um, he was, he himself in his own personal life was pitched to what I might call unselfishness. People like Saint-Germain and Cagliostro could come in and partly use the scientific ideas that were floating about and partly accept them because they were not totally phonies. I'm not trying to say that. But they really were, were people who read a little of this and a little of that, took the latest scientific statements and also made a great deal of money out of it or at least as much money as they could. At that time, then, he turned his attention to the United States, where he had already been working behind the scenes with George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, in actually preparing the Constitution of the United States and inspiring that declaration, as well as the revolution, the freedom of those independent colonies. Just at the moment of indecision, at precisely 5 o'clock, July 4th, 1776, St. Germain appeared on the balcony. The doors remained locked, but he appeared. He gave an impassioned speech to the delegates, and he told them to sign that document. And the energy that he released was so intense that immediately they coalesced, and they all signed the document, beginning with John Hancock. As to the length of St. Germain's life, once again, the experts disagree. I can't, that, I, I can't let that one go by, Steve. <laughs> I can't do it. Um, let's tap the brakes for a minute. Um, what? So. <laughs> what is, is a good word. <laughs> what? <laughs> um. I would believe her if I didn't know that the Declaration of Independence was not signed on July 4th and it was not signed all in what that picture that you see of all of it's a wonderful picture. Ben Franklin's all leaned in John Hancock sitting there and, you know, he says something witty and sharp, you know, like I'm going to sign this big and large enough. So old uh, Charlie can read it without a spectacle. Some, witty thing, and they all laugh ha ha you know it's great good times yeah. right and everybody's there it's bullshit it took like almost eight months to get all the signatures they had to carry the, uh, the copy around to other places because these guys had jobs they had yeah. farms to run plantations to get on with uh businesses you know um 
cargo to loot, you know, whatever they were into. Uh, there were a lot of them were doing uh, 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 smuggling, you know, and things like that. And again, what was smuggling, you know, were they getting goods and paying for them? They just weren't paying the taxes, or was it actual, you know, who, who knows? Either way, they got things to do. It took a long time to sign Declaration of Independence, and it wasn't, you know, they declared it on the fourth, you know. So there was a couple of people around to sign it. And it, I wish it had been like that. The Liberty Bell was ringing. Guy goes, trodges up the old uh, ladder to the Liberty Bell and rings it just as John Hancock is signing the declaration. It's a beautiful thought, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen and this lady, part. this lady just said that jocks at the pivotal moment, everybody was apparently standing around outside know, arguing about, arg arguing about whether or not to sign that Declaration of Independence, a bunch of fence setters. And here comes Jacques St. Germain, bursts onto the balcony, sands opening the doors, just appears, and throws down a Gettysburg Address type uh, speech, I guess, and pushed them all right over the fence. They all ran in, quill in hand, leaning over, ready to no. sign. This is bullshit. I have to call it. One Flag of my on relatives, the play. Richard Flag Stockton. On the play. Richard Stockton was a <laughs> signer of the Declaration of Independence, and uh, he was put in irons for it. And um, the British, oh. uh, I think they imprisoned him for like four months or something. He had been a, a, a lawyer and a judge, and he's one of the signers. But it, it wasn't all signed at, at one time like that. that Fifty-six. That, that's and an artist knew. recreation. This is something. Uh, Cisco knows a lot about because I mean I'm no scholar and I'm certainly no historian, but I know my fair amount of Independence Hall and, and some of the things that's gone down, and I can probably do at least a good set of half of the 1776 musical, so I consider myself at least able to speak on this right here. I'm not calling this lady a fibber. And but I do, she, I do adore her hair. Yeah, I do, that I, hair. That hair. It's that's a, a wash and ready go. That's what <laughs> that is. Um, she was busy. She had other things to do, Steve. Uh, but it, no way that that part. Now I'm not saying the rest of it isn't true. I don't know anything about it because some of the things that she's saying, as I'm listening to her, she's lining up parallel with a lot of other people and their sightings and things like that. That's again, this thing is a mystery from the word get. Yep. And he's raised by the Illuminati, one of the, the the high atop the thing, bloodline families of, you know, too rich to give a shit uh, people that nothing but power. And we're not even a fly speck on the, the, the bottom of their yacht. You know what I'm saying? You put it together your way, add your own words. You understand what I'm saying, you know? I'm no expert on this, but that one right there, hold the phone. Yeah. All right. Shall we continue? We're almost there. Yeah, and you're about, y'all are about ready to be, I, I got to be honest again, and I'll try not to stop it, but the one of the biggest can of crackers you've ever seen since Charlie Chips rolled through your town. You have been warned. <laughs> Saint-Germain's supposed longevity is, again, a traditional ploy used by people who claim to be magicians or alchemists to prove that they have discovered the magic elixir of life. The, the fact of not eating in public, I think, is a very, very, very intelligent ploy of showing that somehow you ingest different types of foods as normal human beings do. There was a rumor that he had died in 1784, but there are memoirs by the Comtesse d'Andema, um, the French lady-in-waiting to Marie Antoinette, uh, indicating that he was seen uh, after 1784 uh, and in fact for some years afterwards so what I really meant was that it wasn't a fact that he had died in 1784 Saint Germain. I tried, but hold on. Get the cheese, folks. Remember the cheddar cheese we were talking about last night that was made in that little beautiful town in Somerset across the pond, right next to that 14,000-year-old cave <laughs> where they found that they were 
cannibals and drinking the blood and first vampires and the bats coming out of the cave and mom's warning their kids that monsters live in this cave and all this this is all part of it but since then going all the way back 14,000 years this is the biggest can of crackers so just bear with me uh it'll be over in a moment steve y'all y'all right yep here we go <laughs> Saturday evening church services in Pasadena, Elizabeth Clare Prophet claims that St. Germain speaks to his followers through her. I am the keeper of the flame of freedom for every nation. St. Germain, you have called me, and Uncle Sam, I am he, and I am here. I am in the flame of the holy science and of that religion which is yours to claim. Yes, I come, a believer and a teacher of the law of reincarnation. The law of the coming again and again of the soul is your cosmic justice. It is that cause of freedom whereby you understand that the goal and the calling of America and every true free nation is to lead mankind into that way of higher consciousness. This is my mantra which I give to you. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. Hail Saint Germain! I got to be honest, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I've been studying vampires going on, but maybe seven, eight weeks. Who knows? You know, just deviling into it and get deeper as I go. You know, a good solid six. Good solid six weeks. That's a lot of vampires. This is scary shit. <laughs> <laughs> and just a little fun fact. She was from Long Branch, New Jersey. Did you know that? That explains all of it. Explains a lot right there. It's all I needed to know. I mean, my gosh. Oh gosh, we're almost there. Hang on, folks. This is, it's it, it, we're almost pulling pull at the end of the end of the ride here. Here we go. It hurts. Wow. Wow. Evidence recently discovered in the library of the British Museum indicates that Saint Germain might well have been the lost third son of Prince Rikoji. Born in Transylvania in 1694. If he died in Germany in 1784, he lived 90 years. The average life expectancy in the 18th century was 35 years. 50 was a ripe old age. 90 was forever. We can account for those 90 years with a reasonable amount of confidence. St. Germain's lives before and after that, however, are a matter of faith. there you go folks i'm telling you what that was some scary stuff that was palpable yeah. it was offensive i mean you could feel it coming at you like oh my gosh and i mean that would scare the shit out of me about that i mean whoa i mean i knew the moonies were a little you know some of that stuff can be quite scary i mean again i the 70s uh, made for TV movies where you yeah. turn around, you wake up and that's all around you. And they're all wearing those witch outfits, like those pilgrim outfits <laughs> and stuff. Holy crap. Race that's, with the devil. Never see that one. That was a good one. 
that that was really scary for its time. But it and was you know kind what? of like Amway and Herbalife with Saint Germain thrown in there. Absolutely. So I don't know where where you're landing, folks. I mean, that was kind of an over, you know, um, an overview. And I don't know. It took a hot kind of. <laughs> it was like a Willy Wonka of Saint Germain there. That whole in search of took a hard left. We were doing all right. We're talking about history. Maybe Ran that guy's lying. Right Maybe, maybe that guy's lying about him dying there in Germany and all that stuff and the whole heartfelt story about him being by his bedside and stuff. I was all right. And then they bring out this 1970s perm chick with her silk PJs. And, you know, she's just so, I, I mean, it reminded me of, of something that rhymes with Yahtzee. You know what I mean? We got to keep it YouTube uh, for the inner tubes. <laughs> yep. For the inner tubes, we got to keep it. To St. Germain there. You know, that was, wow. I mean, not much different. I mean, wow. I don't know. That's just crazy lunatic stuff. But that doesn't take away from the fact that this man was described oh, with she the education. To go out and commit yeah. violence. Oh, they, they you did. know, I mean, there was nothing different there than the 1968 downtown Newark with the Black Panthers and militants of any kind. Gosh, remember, you know what the story I heard the other day? And it was uh, on a cold case uh, podcast something along those lines the patty hearst story and they replayed the um i don't think she was a vampire i'm i'm pretty sure of that though but she did have cute hats but uh and and nice weapons to tell you the truth and uh she um she was the uh, daughter of the the periodical and newspaper and news uh murdoch wasn't she it? made a good the Her, i mean yeah. Hearst, like the, Hearst, the, Hearst the early empire, yeah. yeah yeah empire the early before murdoch um and she they first it started for those who don't know real quick it was a, a, a kidnap and oh my god uh daughter of a rich uh family uh here comes the ransom and the next thing you know i believe it was days next thing <laughs> you know there's a bank being robbed by this underground uh I don't know what they're uh, to tell you the truth. It was the um, who's got it in the chat. Um, oh, shoot. It's right on the end of it. Um, the name of their group. Oh, the Symbionese Liberation Army. Thank you. That one hurt. Thank you, Steve. That was like getting yeah. a splinter out. That was like getting a splinter out <coughs> because it was right there. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, the next thing you know, there's a bank being robbed. We think she's kidnapped in somebody's trunk or basement, tied to a duct tape to a chair, whatever. And there's a bank robbery. And we're seeing all this uh, early 1970s uh, CCTV, which honestly, God, looked better than the shit they show us today. With she changed her name cameras. to Tanya. She had on a wig and sunglasses and was carrying a machine. Cute little gun. outfit. I got to be honest. Cute little outfit. She had a little mini she, skirt and matching stockings. She was a striking all striking right. figure. Yeah, she was a very yep. dashing gorilla. And then came out and started speaking her mind, girl. She went, <laughs> she went out there. She went full tilt boogie and one eighty from this little princess riding around the back of limousines, and you know going back to the the best school her available. Father, the empire who gave away food on the where's the San Francisco mm. or somewhere where they mm. had those yeah, food yeah, yeah. drops. I don't know what the hell they wanted. But they were burning down things and robbing stuff and threatening people all across the thing. They were serious. They had and, all uh, kinds. She did time for all that too. Yeah. She claimed she was brainwashed and yep. coerced and Stockholm syndrome is mentioned there in the chat. 100%. But she did time for her participation in all that. And she then did. they had a big shootout and burned a place down. They thought she was in that, but she wasn't. It was a whole mm -hmm. big hoopla. I remember it well. There's even a rumor in East Tennessee that she was hiding out in a safe house there in the, the Powell neighborhood. But could have been unsubstantiated. Been. Who the knows? The weirdest stuff. Listen to me. Oh, this is a cold hard fact, and you can find it right here on this show right now. A lot of the militants, and I got nothing against. Hey, I ain't criticizing. I'm, I'm just saying. Look, you're gonna do bad things. You know, play stupid games and all that stuff. Yeah. But a lot of these people did not get caught. And or if they got caught, they got quick little underground under the table, you know, scratch my yours and all that kind of mess and yeah. slap on the wrist and became professors in universities. You think and I'm the lying thing about her? They didn't Look really go easy on her because of her father and his holdings and things either. Mm -hmm. They got nice cushy jobs and a nice little 
uh, package in, in universities all across the USA and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and that's, and that's just it. It's, it's really strange to watch that, but you know, uh, the thing about, I think with the Patty Hearst though, if I'm trying to re recall exactly, does, it, does anybody know how long she was held captive before she popped up? If I remember correctly, it was just days. And I remember being a teenager, young teenager, uh, you know, probably 13 or so and hearing it on the news and going, man, they brainwashed her that quick. I mean, there's no way. And I remember thinking there's no way that I was always a weird child. <laughs> Trust me. I'm thinking there's no way they could brainwash somebody from that to that. She had to be in on it to begin with. And that was a scuttlebutt back then, too. She was she kidnapped was on February 4th and then um, appeared on camera at the bank as an SLA member April 15th. So a little over a oh, month. She had that. Yeah, well, it's a short amount of time, but you could sure MK. You, you could sure was, scramble uh, somebody's cookies at that amount of time. She was uh, wielding an M1 carbine and helping rob the Sunset District branch of the Hibernia yeah. Bank in San possible. Francisco. Yep. That's totally possible. It could be Stockholm Syndrome. And I mean, yelled, they Tanya. could break. Yeah. I'm Tanya up against the wall, MFers. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I'm sure that was a t-shirt. If not, it would be at this time, you know, a oh, God, what a crazy world we're in, man. So I don't know. I don't know about, uh, I don't have any answers on St. Germain, but to know the things he, he knew, I mean, all the stuff about him being alchemist, all the stuff about taking flaws out of diamonds, supposedly spent time in India to learn that. All the languages, you know, 12 or more, who knows, uh, all these. So good that when he went and visited the country, Steve, they took him in as a native. That's yeah. saying something. That, that's really saying something, to be that fluent in language. That, that's yeah, like and, and these own. things of these royals that are saying that they spent time with him 40 years, 50 years before, and he looks the same. Those are the things that I spent a lot of time paying attention to. And just to kind of take us out tonight. Um, I did some studying from the 70s up, and there's multiple accounts of him being seen. There's, of course, he's changed and looked more a little more modern, but and fitting all of at, the look characteristics. Look the accounts of people running into him on Mount Shasta. Yeah. I've got that in a video over on my channel. There you it's, go. It's, there it's you go. Incredible. Connect up to Steve. What's the name of that one, Steve? I I think it's just uh, Mysteries of Mount Shasta or something like that. It's on my channel. And it's in there. So there you go. It's sightings all over. So who is this guy? Is he the Forrest Gump of, you know, the Medici family? <laughs> um, is it, it, Does he have some knowledge because he is a part of that family? You know, what are all these connections? What What is all this? Again, I ask you guys, we're all just getting puzzle pieces here, right? And some of you, you're throwing them out from the chat. That's why I love this chat. Because we get that information. We're presenting stuff and going, what do you think about it? And I think there's something going on here. And I have no problem believing that somebody back in the day, whatever. This guy was supposed to have, some have even said he was Merlin. Some have said that, you know, uh, uh, he, he hung out with him. I mean, there's stuff across time with this guy, you know. So what is it? Did he I find a secret? Yeah. Was there some kind of secret, you know, like I said in the chat earlier, blood with wine? He, did he find the elixir of life? What are all these people doing in New Orleans where they're asking people? Funniest thing I've ever seen, Steve. And, you know, we won't we'll just touch on it, and move on. But the funniest thing I ever saw was a, 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 a street full of people moving, all wearing masks, all going into a vampire uh, club to suck each other's blood. This is the world we're in, folks. So you you do with that what you will, and you you chew on that one for a second and think about it. But it's happening. It happened. I watched video after video of these vampires. They're let's just put it this way: they're in the vampire life. They're deep into it in New Orleans or New York or Atlanta, what whatever Paris, all over. They obviously mostly focus on night. They choose a king and queen. Um, those people are ruling over the coven, I guess, or the nest or the group, um, you know, uh, that they're dressing up. They all have different characters that they're bringing out. And again, it's not unlike being in a cult 
or being in a gang or being in a group or a tribe or whatever, right? It's people that feel like they are something different, finding like-minded people to hang out with. The creepy part is about the blood aspect and we can't understand why people would do this. I certainly don't, you know, but there, I watched shows where they had clinical people, let's just say doctors, whatever, that are actually saying that if these people stop doing it, they obviously show a difference uh, from when they, they're doing it. And you sit down, you listen to these people, Steve, like this guy here. This is, you would look at this guy. I'm not going to play the music. There we go. You would look at this guy right here. And you would think, this is the creepiest dude ever. I'm not going to go in, you know, I'm going to walk, move across the street from him. And he had this annoying thing attached to his hat for whatever reason, I don't know. But again, I've been at many a powwow where lots of things are hanging off of people's heads. So you try to just focus and hear what he's got to say, but it's hard. And he's got the fangs. His are permanent. These are serious vampires, Steve. And they get up there and they have their podcasts, they have their talks, and they have their beliefs. And um, they talk almost in a calming way. And you wonder if that's part of the persona of, of that whole vampirish thing. But really, just down to earth people, most of them. There's some that you would go, okay, next, you know, th thank you, I'm good, you know, because they're a little bit too extra. And this guy looks extra, but he really speaks well. And he explains it well. So if you're interested in understanding this, this I forget his name, Sebastian, I believe. He's got a YouTube yeah, channel. Father, Father Sebastian. I know somebody, that one of his followers. It's the most ridiculous shit yeah, I've ever heard. Just to absolutely. Be absolutely. And but he will he, sell you custom things. And he gives you <laughs> talks. And you become part of his covenant. And it's all a bunch of horse hockey. Yeah, again, it's like, you know, finding people you want to become a, a, a gang, you know, a gang. And they he explains it. Now, the thing I watched, he was in this documentary with this chick from one of, one of these shows, investigative. And they're down there and they're talking to all these different vampires. Some are, you know, the head vampire, the king, whatever. They have different names. And like I said, this guy that has the podcast and he's explaining everything about the energy uh, exchange and other stuff. So if you're interested in all that stuff go here and that's a link to a, a lot of other ones that are talking about it but as far as here tonight i don't get it i do understand um all the different cultures that believe that consuming now this guy i like this guy so like, i don't know what he's about but i like his look <laughs> and you know some of this is absolutely gorgeous that's gorgeous but here's the thing when you walk down into New Orleans, it's palpable, isn't it, Steve? You can feel it. You feel it going in and when you're leaving. And uh, that's not to say that I think that everybody here is evil or bad or whatever. What I'm saying is this is the right atmosphere for it to mingle and it to pick up on people that just need a little push. You understand what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's hard to... As much as we like seeing stuff, you know, like this is like, oh, wow, that'd be a great Halloween costume or whatever. These people are doing this every day and it's got to take it all. Isn't that a cool shot, Steve? The okay. time traveling. And that's what I think. I think this dude, if he was part of a powerful family, if they were had access to to multiple time frames with, of uh, people like Tesla and God knows who else, you know, da vinci or whatever what does he know is he a time traveler and i think in other than the blood thing and the wine and the appearing and disappearing in, in different stories who's to say but the gliding was very prominent in a lot of the stories the not eating um you know how education and everything else Again, time travelers could have that. And of course the money, but um, who knows what these powerful families um, are about and um, who knows what, what their limits are as far as things they have that we don't know they have, you know, they could be hooked up for with alien intelligence for all we know, or, or uh, 
portal and ley line uh, locations. I mean, they built all of Washington, D.C. based on ley lines and and symbols and phallic things. And if you don't think that stuff is real, do you know what's behind the doors of uh, Club 33 in Disney World? When you get deep in there, I hear tell that it's a big old statue of a demon that requires children to be sacrificed to it. The same one that if you dig around in 33 degree masonry shows up. Yep. Symbols and carved and on knives. And Grove. It's, 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 it's all connected. Same right? one. Same one. The same one that, you know, when they are given the symbols and all that stuff with hooked up to the families. So again, is this something that we're making very supernatural because we don't understand, say, maybe equipment or inventions or things that elixirs, you know, that we don't know about. So it looks supernatural to us or is there really vampires out there? And if so, is Jacques Germain one? I don't know. But I like the time traveler thing. Yeah. But but that doesn't explain the blood. It doesn't explain the multiple people that have like escaped from him or, you know, and again, he's hopping countries like, you know, you and I go well, to if he uh, was Dunkin' a time Donuts. Traveler, if he was a time traveler, was that just a dog and pony show that he put on to right. make people think he was something immortal or Good whatever? Good point. Good point. Could all been a show. It could have been. He could have been an undercover time traveler. I mean, Psy most up. of most of them are. It could be a psyop. Everything's a freaking psyop. Remember, Campbell's soup label is a psyop. Psy <laughs> Oreo <laughs> cookies. Everything. Look at the Psy symbols on an Oreo. Knights of the Templars. Up. There you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's Templars. a true story yeah. about behind the doors. And what is this thirty three? And why are all these really elite clubs? These you know eyes wide shut. Um, shut your mouth clubs all those things you know the skull and bones the why are the why why are there elite people riding around running around with a skull that they claim belonged to geronimo and that how why is that okay why is it okay to even joke about it if it's not true you know do you see what i'm saying why is that uh, uh, why is that a thing who is this lady and what the hell are they doing with this you know yahtzee kind of stuff and that, that that was it was just it you knew you didn't want to be around it whatever feeling you want to call that but that doesn't take away from what was this guy these got this obviously they think he's a second coming of what, uh, who knows what because they're wow that would be a scary room to be in steve i don't know yeah. What'd you take away from the whole thing? Vampire, time traveler, or big I, old I feel line? a little more normal than I used to. <laughs> and that's what reality TV does for us. At least we're not as bad as them. As long as we can stay in that side of the fence, right? We're not we're not hoarders quite as bad. So my my fibber McGee, there's a reference for you. My fibber McGee closet isn't as bad as you know the hoarders I saw last week on the uh, on uh whatever you call it hoarders i guess but or jerry springer you know i guess my neighbors aren't so bad they're not throwing chairs at me you know and so make all to keep you in this 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 cocoon of just go to work pay your bills pay your taxes and shut up you know and you know you're and you're not as miserable as what you're looking at you're fine you know and uh just keep grinding just keep running on the the hamster wheel and don't look up you know but weird stuff's going on all around us i don't i don't know about this guy i think we all are kind of just like vampires steve we were talking last night about movies and we'll get out of here um the different way the movies portray the vampire and how dracula 1937 with bella lugosi really captured um that bram stoker and like i showed before in the uh the the slides here uh, that young kid it all goes back um now again this is what we know about here this is you know in asia and romania and all so many different countries uh, africa even they had their own version of the vampire now how it collectively wound up with the vampire needing to be invited in 
uh, weak, uh, uh, weakened by garlic, um, obviously weakened by any uh, holy relic, um, a religious item or uh, uh, space or, you know, property or, you know, surroundings. Um, heals quickly, um, depending on when it last fed. I mean, the details in this is astronomical. And most of this is found in Bram Stoker's Dracula. Most of it. Um, the sun uh, will, co will combust. It burns, uh, uh, makes them combust. Um, weakened, uh, must be staked while it's asleep in the coffin. Now, we lost that along the way. I have to say that's one for sure that we've kind of loosened the ropes on because you're seeing vampires getting killed all kinds of ways. You know, for a couple of movies, you had to take their whole head off like zombies, um, but they're getting stabbed by all kinds of things like tree branches and cow horns and all kinds of stuff and dying. So obviously you don't have to stake them in the coffin anymore while they're asleep. But that originally started with Bram Stoker's Dracula. Um, the whole hypnotic trance thing, that thing, Steve, where you just lock eyes with something. We said it before with my cowboy that came in. You just like, I almost didn't want to look him in the eye because I felt it. Don't do it. You know, like a, a Medusa thing. You turn into to snakes or whatever or stone. And th they, they kept that in Dracula, but we kind of lost that along the way. And it's kind of evolved more into a, just real quick, I'm going to think it and you're going to do it. And they showed that in Dracula's, Bram Stoker's Dracula with Gary Oldman with the the scene right there, see me, see me now. And she's walking down the street. She turns and she looks at him. Very much like Steve and I started it, this whole story in the beginning with the Grinners and the people that know when you know. You know, countless stories, right, Steve? that you've heard in your lifetime about that, where they're just thinking it, it turns and it, look, it turns and it looks at you. And it's still to this day makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck and right up my back and the chill go up my spine and the, and, and the hair on my forearms go. And I know, get out of there. Just remove yourself from the situation. It's not my day to battle. Right, Steve? That's what right. do you got going on this week, my friend? Uh, I got a video coming out probably tomorrow. I'll be on um, First Floor Audio with Lee G tomorrow night. Nicole and I'll be over there. And my new book series on Amazon uh, up to, I think they're getting number six ready to go. Wow, I'll drop dude. drop a link there in the chat. I and, like that um, last one you did. That was, that was a nice and one. And my publisher's making a separate channel where I'm going to be narrating all those books. There's going to be at least eight books in that series, possibly more. Wow. Steve, I've been staying, busy. You staying busy, man? You're out there in the land of the the uh, uh, the witch trials, and the, pretty soon it's going to be pumpkin carving time and pumpkin spice, and leaves are going to start to fall. What a place to be for fall yeah, this year! I'm, I can't wait. Can't wait to spend what my first a place fall in to New be. England. Wow, I'm so jealous. First fall in New England. <laughs> That's nice though. Where I'm sitting, I'm about an hour from Salem. And, wow. Um, I don't know if I'll go there for Halloween. That just, it's like going to New Orleans for Mardi Gras. You probably don't want to go there. Yeah, maybe Halloween like the week. week before when everybody's just like getting, like, yeah, geared out they're for getting it. amped up into it. We've actually talked about going to Terrytown, New York, and doing the Sleepy Hollow thing for Halloween since it's my birthday. That Still crazy, good. but not, not as crazy as Salem gets. Oh, man, Sleepy Hollow for Halloween. Hey, maybe we can meet up there. Wouldn't that be nice? Ride the old carriage through the through the Sleepy Hollow uh, uh, yeah. graveyard where Ichabod Crane himself walked and 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 rode his horse through the graveyard. Just just you know, just yeah. anticipating. It wasn't for Ichabod Crane. It wasn't uh, if he was going to see the headless horseman. It was when because yeah. he knew it was coming. He was shaking through that whole story, man. But what a story, right? And he uh, crossed that bridge and getting into the graveyard. I wonder if that's there, but you can take a carriage ride and it's basically uh, Ichabod Crane's ride through all of, they have all the pumpkins, yeah, all they, carved. They the, Amazing. The, the graveyard, just like it was. Man, um, we should do it. We should meet yeah. out there for Halloween. Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. All right, my friend, you say hi, hug Nick for me 
and uh, 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 Squeeze Molder. And uh, I'll see you next week. And we'll try to not answer other questions that we don't know the answers to. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> good night, love everybody. Y'all. I love y'all. Have a good one. Thanks, oh, this one's, this one's pretty. Good night, everybody. We'll leave with some light tonight. Wandering Soul by Asher Valero. You're going to love it. Good night, sweetheart. Good night.